What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Skinny Moose. And your boy Fat Squirrel. And uh, the ultraviolet beast himself, Masada. What's up, guys? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, I, you know, Masada. Everybody knows Masada. So let's go ahead and kick it off. The first question is, what made you want to become a wrestler? Well, the thing is, like when I was a kid, uh, funny enough. It's like when the territories were still around, wrestling was always on TV. So like when I would get out of out of school at five, at age five, like ESPN had like wrestling on at that time and then American kickboxing. So I was always was intrigued by it, you know, it's crazy, you know, you don't know what's going on. I always like like action movies and you know, I just got sucked into it, you know. I think at one point in time or any point in time, if somebody watches wrestling, they think to themselves they want to do it, you know? <laughs> or at least try. I'm one. I, I fall on that list. Hey. You honestly look like a horror film guy, to be honest. Like, you like a lot of horror films. <laughs> right. Well, I like horror films. I like all kinds of movies. Horror's cool. Hell yeah. My question is, did you always want to be a deathmatch wrestler? Was that your first career choice? Well, the thing is, like, when I started training in wrestling, it was in 99, so hardcore wrestling was really popular. So when I first started training to wrestle, uh, like, I did more high flying. Like, the funny thing is, when I started wrestling, I only weighed, like, 155 pounds at 6'2". I was skinny as shit. Um, so I did a lot of high flying. But I also did like hardcore matches and whatnot because that's what the you know what people thought was a draw at the time. But I mainly just focused on wrestling and I always think like if you're gonna be a wrestler you need to be the best at everything or at least know a little bit of everything, it's true. you know. It's true. You don't wanna close the like, doors like, hey, if I wanna to go to Mexico I need to know Lucha Libre, if I wanna to go to Japan I need to do no strong style or basic like mat wrestling, you know. You have to. And he's a really good fucking technical wrestler. I was watching him and Akira last night in ICW, and uh, he he kills it. I mean, like, a lot of his matches, he don't even need weapons. He's just, you know, a good groundsman. He can do just about any type. He's been all over the world. I mean, it's Masada. What the hell you expect? <laughs> well, that's like, so, you, know, uh, you know, if you watch, like, guys like Loki, where they take, like, more or less, like, shoot-style wrestling like pancreas and then mix it into pro wrestling. I mean, it's really cool, you know. And wrestling's an art form, you know what I mean? It's an open book. Yeah, it's it's a it's a story in itself. WWE Sunday Night Heat. Uh, it was cool, you know. Funny thing is, when I when I got to the building, I did training with the catering, and they were going to use me as a security guy. And then uh, Johnny A. Sergeant Slaughter, like, nah, you look too much like a wrestler, especially with this. This is all the reason why I even got the match on Sunday Night Heat is because of my beard. Like, you don't really look like a security guard. You look more like a wrestler. And then uh, Sergeant Slaughter's like, how would you like to uh, wrestle Maven on Sunday Night Heat? Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I, I mean, I can see you being a security guard, but I have a feeling that ra ra wrestling suits you better. I mean... Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, it's like a lot of people don't know, but when I wrestled Maven, we were curtain jerk, you know. So when they actually aired it, I think it was on the USA Network, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they took our match from curtain jerk and they put it semi main on the taping on the TV. Yeah. So that's very cool. You know, that says something. When literally you take the first yeah. match, the very first show of Raw, and then put it, you know, in a semi main event on Heat. So that was cool. Excuse me. That was cool. Hell yeah. I'd like, I mean, you know, your t main event, to me, if you have a good opener, like a good first round match, and you have a good main event, but also what goes into play for me is a good commentator and a good ring announcer. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I, I love Larry Legend, you know, I love Ron Neamey, um, Struggs was good. He actually quit being a commentator to do his own thing. And there's plenty of other good commentators and ring announcers. Emerald J. You've been introduced by almost all of them, if not all of them. 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, no. I can't really think of anybody uh, on the spot. I do have to say that bias, I always love when uh, when Larry Legend announces me. Oh, Larry Legend, he puts a, he, I don't know, he puts some kind of kick or something into it. Like, that, them vocals, he's been doing it for years, and I know, like, even before he was a ring announcer, he was training his vocals. He, because, um, I'm not for sure which – I was watching something. It might have been on the Boulevard Bullies when he was talking about how he got on the Wheel of Fortune. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was doing a thing on there, and then he, you know, done the ring announcing for CZW and a couple of other older promotions. And, you know, it, it amazes me how he's always had that voice and how he, he can switch from introducing Masada – and he can go pondo and just – he kicks it off with everybody's name and how he – Slack and, you know, you and there's others. Yeah, Larry's a man. Like, Larry's awesome. Oh, yeah. He definitely draws your attention as soon as you hear his voice and is like, woo. Yes. And I don't know if you watch – go back and watch, like, you and XBW or whatever – but Larry on commentary, he fucking kills it. <laughs> he'll get on there and he'll get to saying something and then he'll just go to cussing his head off, fucking head off. And then he'll go back to commentating like nothing happened and then go back to cussing. And I'm like, Larry, what are you doing? <laughs> nothing against Larry, but I'm like, make my mind up here, Larry. That's why he's the legend. <laughs> like, yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, there's no limits, you know, so that's what's cool. Say, do you use bamboo skewers? Have you ever thought about using other type of skewers? Uh, one time, Hernandez like told me he's like, since I do like metal fabrication and knife making, he's like, why don't you make uh, skewers out of metal? And you know, like I could do it, but I honestly don't think it would look that good because it has weight. You know what I mean? It would stick and probably fall out, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sakuda does metal skewers, don't he? Who does? Sakuda? Uh, I don't know. I know they use like the thing called Kenzons that are used for like uh, floral arrangements. So if you cut a flower, you stick it into the spikes and it keeps it up, standing up. Uh, I know when he fought Neil Diamond Cutter, he pulled out these metal looking skewers. They may be like steel or aluminum. And I'm probably saying his name wrong. But he's the little short Japanese guy that carries around the uh, three metal looking skewers. He's the one that does like the piercings of them, yeah, right? Yeah, the one through the mouth and then the ones through the nose or wherever he puts them. Yeah, I'm not sure what exactly those are. You know, I've just seen pictures of it. But uh, yeah, I have no idea. I would imagine because when he sticks it in, it looks like they go in pretty relatively easy even though it looks like that looks like it hurts like hell obviously but imagine if they're like thick skewers you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to pierce that that's like trying to stick it like a nail through your cheek <laughs> you know what i mean that's not gonna go very easy and uh g graver and the channel. Oh. yeah i did the tattoo needles yeah g raver and ain't it grim reefer them two do tattoo needles ain't it or is it just g raver yeah, like, everybody, yeah. ever since the bamboo skiers come in, I've noticed that a lot of things has been coming into play with the mouth and something that hints around to the skiers, like the the cicudas and uh, the tattoo needles. Everything's just hitting around the, you know, the skiers. Yeah. Well, there's always a different, like, psychology behind using them. Like, I always use them as like a desperation thing if i can't finish the guy then i'm going to stab him with him and you know try to take him out or if it's a rivalry <laughs> like try to bait somebody in like go outside the ring and then they try to get me and then quickly stab him that has like a shock value surprise you know yeah yeah so um what is your worst injuries or your major ones my worst mm, I'd say the one that was probably the biggest pain in the ass was when my knee blew out on me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I took some time. Well, I say I took some time off. I really didn't. But 
that's probably been like the worst one. Um, as far as like getting cuts and getting stitches, that's nothing. Even getting lit on fire, you know, that sucked. That was pretty bad to be in ICU. That's the first time, but honestly, it's nothing that was like freaking out of my head. Like, you know, I can't overcome this. You know what I mean? That that fire spot. I, and I have a question on that, but but that fire spot was intense. It was intense. I <laughs> there's a story behind that. <laughs> I, I I did not know. Like uh, I was expecting you to do something with it, because honestly, and then when I see it fire back, I got a hold of squirrel. Like we watched a lot of death matches, and I'm like, Masada just got his fucking face on fire, dude. It's probably third degree burns. Yeah. Well, yeah. The crazy thing is, yeah, it's second degree burns. It screwed up my tattoo here, which uh, eventually I need to get fixed and. My face and my shoulder and my hand. My hand really is what got it the worst. Uh, my left hand. I seen some uh, pictures and in, uh, in another interview of you in the hospital, and I also seen you on like Facebook. People uploading pictures. I'm like, God damn, how bad did that fire really get him? Yeah. Well, the the screwed up thing is like, you know, uh, it was last second, like planned in the match, put in there. And, uh, you know, I told the sound guy, I was literally taking Zippo fluid. I've done the, I've done this before, like in Japan, but in Japan, you're doing it like an arena, you know? So there's no wind blowing the flame right in your, right in your face. Um, so I didn't think it accounted that, but I wanted to make sure like fans were safe, you know, like, yeah. as as night, like our fan in between the rings to make sure nobody got hurt. And uh, sad to say, or funny to say, it's not the first time I've been on fire, like forging knives and dealing with metal and sparks and crap. <laughs> that's not the first time. So that's why I just instinctively ran forward to get the flames to go behind me and then slap yeah. them out. Uh, and I told the sound guys, like, hey, don't let anybody touch this. It's in a water bottle. Uh, Drake's music hits, and the first thing Drake does is tells the sound guys, like, oh, I need some water to get it amped for his match or whatever. And... <laughs> He takes it, and the sound guy's like, don't use it. And then he takes a big swig, pours it over his head. And he's like, oh, that's not water. And the sound guy's like, yeah, I told you that's not water. So then I had to refill it really quick. So him doing that already encased the bottle with Zippo fluid. Oh, you know, and, you know, I'm next to go out. So it's like, shit, I got to hurry this up. So the first fireball was cool, you know, because the wind wasn't blowing. The second one was bad because... You know, I'm literally going straight in between uh, the two rings, and it's, you know, it's an open arena, you know, so the wind's blowing. So as soon as I spit it out, it caught my lips, and then when I went like this to put it out, that bottle already had the, the zipper fluid on it. And so it just, you know, went up in flames, as you saw. And then when I went like this, Ooh. it fell on my hand, and, you know, it was a big mess. <laughs> you know, and then they... I, I'm not too big on fire, but I mean, uh, I mean, it has its place. Uh, I mean, every time I've used fire or had them in matches, I've never, I never gotten burned like that. That was definitely a first in over all the years. I've even done like fire matches when I was in Big Japan and never got burned. When uh, they lit a ball bar board on fire and literally the ball bar branded into my back, and that. Yeah, that hurt like a motherfucker. <laughs> that sucks. So, uh, I don't know if you use it or not, but there's this app called Clapper. It's um, a live app. And it's something like TikTok. And you was actually posted on there talking about, I'll have to send you the video, but talking about how your face got caught on fire. And I'm like, this is Masada, you know, I went into full detail, it was California too, he was trained, the fire spot was not supposed to, you know, burn his face half off, but, you know, it was, it was when it just happened, and everybody was talking about it, and I'm like, y'all don't know what the hell y'all talking about in these comments, y'all just on here wanting to get clout and shit, so I'm yeah. like, this is what really happened, you know, come and check my live out, I'll explain it to you, ask me, you know, and then last night I was live on Clapper, and I was like, Masato will be coming to the channel tomorrow. Come and check him out, you know. Listen for it. He'll explain all the questions and everything. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, you know, shit happens. <laughs> like, like I mean, gonna continue. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to continue. I'm not going to just go in the back and be like, the hell with this, you know? Skin ripping off and all, you know? I'm still going to finish the match. That fucked me up. Like, you continued for, what was it, 12, 15 minutes after that? And finished the match? And I'm like... No, no. Yeah, the thing is, I felt really bad because there's a point where uh, Mercer threw Arrow Boy on top of me, and then you know Arrow Boy's got his mask on, and I've known Arrow Boy for years, and you know to hear him freak out when he saw my face, it's like, oh fuck, man. I feel bad because like he's in shock over it. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, I'm okay. Okay, it's all right. You know. That's the good thing is that you're okay, and. Like I, po- I made a post, and you have to have the love to be a deathmatch wrestler, and you also have to have the love for the fans. I mean, a lot of y'all do it because y'all have always wanted to, but a lot of y'all do it for us. Yeah, and definitely. A lot of wrestlers will tell you y'all wouldn't be nothing without y'all's fans and who makes y'all. Yeah. And yeah. that's one thing I feel... That is better about deathmatch wrestlers and independent wrestlers over big wrestlers like, you know, WWE and AEW is y'all actually want to interact with us. Y'all actually want to build a bond with us and get to know us and stuff. And, what you know, for the ones that actually grew up watching like John Cena or Stone Cold, they might get like a high at a convention or some shit, but... Other than that, they don't want nothing to do with us, really. Yeah. Well, and that's what that. really impresses me with Deathmatch Wrestlers. Like, you have some of your heels, you bring it into reality, but a lot of y'all will sit down and inter- do interviews or, or accept our Facebook requests to just talk to us or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's the thing I've always said before. It's like you have the three S, you know, fans become friends and then friends become family. So, you know, like, hell, wrestling for 24 years, you know, it's like it is family. You know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) I'm with uh, fans and my actual, like, blood family, you know, especially being, you know, gone for so many years. So Yeah, one of my uh, YouTube partners, our YouTube partner, Chubby Chipmunk, you you probably know him. I'll send you a shoot name because he knows you really well. He's from Texas. And um, he go, he he always talks about Masada, and I'm like, we know, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I mean, um, like the thing with, oh, sorry to cut you off, but like that's kind of like the thing too with like deathmatch wrestling. The whole point of deathmatch wrestling is to, you know, the believability of like pro wrestling. You know, it's supposed to come off like a shoot, you know. So I think a lot of things have gotten lost over the years uh, with that aspect, you know. If you follow me on social media, you'll see me crazy, post some crazy stuff like off the wall, pissed off. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, that's my character and that's Masada. That's not who I really am. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry to cut you off. No, you're good. I come to the conclusion that I'm not going to piss you off in a dark alley. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you're like, I mean, um, Brian White was like, have you ever seen Masada in person? And I'm like, no. And he goes, Masada's a big, big, big man. And I'm like, I can tell. I do not want to piss this man (laughs) off. Dude, I'm legit 6'2", 235. (laughs) Pissing him off, maybe, but we know after you piss Masada off, he pulls out those skiers, and I took him. I mean, you know, squirrel has, but you, you do bundles, and I'm just like amazed how you make them go in so, so smoothly. Like I could barely stick one in, <laughs> and you take like fifty of them and just like. And I'm like, yeah, how yeah. the hell does he do it so smoothly? Well, the funny thing is, I mean, it's a hundred of packs, so that's a hundred <laughs> bamboo sticks sticking out of someone's head. Jesus. And if I used to do it like that, I used to do them individually. I would do one at a time. 
And uh, when I wrestled Mammoth Sasaki in Freedoms, Pain's the Limit tournament, I think it was the second one, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I was trying to get the skewers out of my pocket, and it, it took fucking forever. And you could hear the crowd, so I was like, out oh, of hell of it. You know, I just took them all and stabbed it in his head and got the fans back into it. So, <laughs> like, that wasn't something that was planned of just doing them all at once, <laughs> you know? Hell yeah. <laughs> That's faster, and I feel like it does more damage than just one, but, you know, you're trained, you're trained to do it, I'm not, you know, Squirrel got this bright idea, like, let's do a skewer at 50 subs, and I'm like, I'm not going to, yeah. no. he's like, well, I'll do it, I'm like, I'm not trained, he's like, well, you're doing it, I'm like, I'm not trained, and he's like, <laughs> it ain't going to be that bad, and I'm like, Fine. You know what? Whatever. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it, it's amazing. It still amazes me. Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, the thing is, I don't just give it to people and uh, don't expect to get it back, you know? So I know what they feel like. They, they suck. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, I wrote some taboo and I told my guy, it's all right, you'll be okay. And then we did it in the match. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> He's like, holy shit. Same thing with New Jack. Probably the only wrestler that stabbed New Jack, uh, you know, rest his soul, but probably the only wrestler that stabbed New Jack and didn't get stabbed back. <laughs> oh, shit. I love on New Jack, though. Yeah, New Jack was awesome. What is it like to be one of you ever to win back-to-back -back TOD? What did it feel like? I mean, I guess I'll be like honored to go in so many tournaments and be number one, be on top, you know. I think a lot of people like in the Northeast have forgotten about that because it's a new fan base, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's cool. It's like majority of most tournaments I've been in, I've won. The only one I haven't won is uh, California. Yeah, he's been – oh, my God. He's been in so many fucking tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen him in East Coast Masters of Pain. I've seen him in TOP. I think he was in one of the King of the Death Matches. Yeah, I've yeah. been, uh, been in two of them. I've been in Dorf, uh, uh, WX. Obviously, Pain and Women in Japan. I was in three of those. Yeah. Um, so. I, no matter where I look, I mean, I've done research, and I can't seem to find you in Carnage Cup or Deep South anywhere. No, that's one tournament I haven't gone to or uh, or promotion I've worked for. Um, I was in a work to to uh, Carnage Cup, but the thing is, I ended up missing my flight, and then, you know, things just didn't work out. And this last one they had, they were trying to get me. But it's a pain big, it's just travel conflict. Oh, I'd love to see you in a cup, dude. You in the finals of a cup? Oh. So, um, uh, one of the questions, another question is, why didn't you stay with ROH? Uh, because Gabe Spikulski really didn't care for me. Like, <laughs> I guess the I feeling was me. I understand that. It's like if you watch the matches in Ring of Honor, I was doing a lot of high flying at a, as a big guy. So there's politics in between, and you know, if people see you as a threat, they'll definitely stab you in the back and make sure uh, to get rid of you. Yeah, like once. Yeah, I understand that. Like you know, there's a lot of like I said earlier, when you go to big mainstream wrestling or whatever it's called. They, they seem to forget their main stars. Like, to me, Cody Rhodes is a big star. And he, he's bigger than Roman Reigns. I'm sorry. Look, you know. He's definitely, he's definitely a really good worker, good wrestler, for sure. And I feel like Ro Cody should get more than he's getting right now. Right now. Ooh, he's been at it, and the thing is, he left the company before because he wasn't happy. So, you know, he's gonna, you know, he'll push his dream. You know what I mean? WWE's not that ignorant to uh, the face. You know, everybody wants to see him finally get that belt. So, eventually, it'll happen. Yeah. 
I love to go get that belt. I've seen, I, I've watched at, as Skinny Moose is a fan, so I've seen you wrestle a lot internationally. What is your favorite place to wrestle internationally? Uh, my favorite place for the longest time was Japan. Uh, but Japan are my two favorites, and I like Germany, so I mean, I don't really have a favorite. I mean, honestly, when it comes to uh, really uh, stiff matches, it would be Japan and Mexico. Japan and Mexico. Like, Mexico. Like, Mexico. In AEW, like, I wrestled him in a steel cage match in Mexico. Yeah. Have you ever been to Zena? Zona? Uh, I've been to before, but it's never worked out. Like, I worked for Chilanga Mask. I worked for... Uh, uh, MDA, uh, Lucha Libre Boom, The Crash. Jay and I think if you watch my matches in Mexico, I was always wrestling like veteran luchadors, you know, like LA Park, Pagano, Psychosis, you know. I mean, we got a lot of, um, you got a lot of work on uh, IWTV, and you got some Japan matches on there. But once you, we hit YouTube, you got a little bit of Japan matches, but very, very many international matches, like nowhere. So I can't seem to find them. Uh, the thing is, majority of that stuff is sold on DVDs. And I think a lot of things that are put on YouTube is fans putting it up. And then, you know, all the time that I spend in England and in Germany, you can't find any of those matches. Um, you know, I think basically you would have to, Order the DVDs, you know, through a high spots or a smart mark video. Hell yeah, I'm about to try to check that shit out, get some more. Because I've watched a lot of your stuff over here in the States, and I know you've gotten done like over 700 matches or more. Oh, probably you're one, of, you're one of the top guys on Cage Match and uh, another site, so I know you got matches out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Like, I like to take like all my all my work and all my matches. Not every match is the same. You know, if you watch the last time I went to Ring of Honor, it's technical wrestling against Roderick Strong. If you watch like Combat Zone, you know I'm flying around with Ar Fox, you know, and wrestling technical matches with Adam Cole and Drew Gulak. You know, the thing is, uh, you know, I proved I can hang with anybody. You know what I mean? And I've always prided myself of being a legitimate hybrid wrestler that can go in there and work with anyone, you know, go hold for hold, move for move with them, you know. And I wrestle low-key in a strong style match, so, you know. Yeah, have a lot of uh, or Remedy. Remedy. Yeah, yeah, Remedy. I haven't checked that out yet, but I'm going to definitely. I mean, funny thing is, I got the Bob R. Bat I was beating the hell out of him with right here. Oh, shit. Like, that is cool. <laughs> that, that is awesome. cool. I think these bats look cooler than the ones that are just, like, overly wrapped with Bob wire. Those damn things are freaking heavy. <laughs> yes. I, when I was younger, I decided to wrap a bat in Bob wire, and... My idea didn't work out too well because I was like young. I was like seven, eight years old. And I just seen it laying around and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do something with it. And I decided that I wasn't going to use a wooden ball bat. I was going to use a steel or aluminum whatever ball bat. And well, my, my ball bar kept sliding down and I'm like, you yeah. know. And I really didn't. I mean, I, I grew, I watched some ECW, but, you know, I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to do with this, so I'll just put it up in the closet. Yeah. I think with, like, an aluminum <laughs> bat, you would have to, like, drill holes and stick the wire through the hole and, like, really wrap the crap out and then drill another hole and stick it in. Uh, I mean, the crazy thing is, and it's funny because, you know, I don't know if your fans are like The Walking Dead, but, you know, the guy that actually uh, came up with the comic book, saw Onita, and then actually that's what he based Negan off of, the look with the picker jacket and the ball wire baseball bat. Oh, that's fucking cool. I mean, it's oh, small work. Yeah. I mean, so, 
you ever see any interviews with him, they ask him, like, where'd you come up with the character Negan? So, so Nita and then across with uh, Henry Rollins, the face. I knew that Negan looked like somebody, but I just couldn't place my finger on it. So I thank you for that. So you've done answered the question on how how the question was the fireball shot in XBW. How bad did you get burned? You answered that. So uh, yeah, I'll show you like even my hand. Like it doesn't probably look too much like on the camera, but the oh, crazy thing it. when uh, it's freezing cold, this turns like purple, and then. My shoulders like really discolored. Oh shit! Tied to my neck, so you know. So, uh, how did you feel fighting Spider Budro? I like Spider. A lot of people bring that up, you know. And uh, the reason why I got stiff like that is because if we're talking and we're we're putting stuff together, you know, people think I'm an asshole, and you know, somebody watches like, oh yeah, he is an asshole. The thing is, like, if I ever forgot spots when I was younger, you know, you saved the match. You know what I mean? And guys lay it in. Necro's one of them. You know, uh, Hernandez is another guy. But that's just part of the business. But when I'm working with you and, like, you know, I'm selling everything you're giving me. And then when I'm trying to work with you, like, ram your head in the buckle, you're not going with me. And you start stiffening it up on me. It's like, hell no, dude. I've been doing this for way too long. You know, now I'm going to show you, like, yeah, you, you just fucked up, like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I don't have any ill will towards him. I'm I'm sad that uh, he passed away. You know, that really sucks. Yeah. You know, we lost Spider. a lot of. And, uh, Spider was one of, another one of my favorites. I love Spider and Carnage Cup. And he was uh and deep. Um, uh, he's been in just a lot of them. He was in a uh, Masters of Pain. He was in Cup. I mean, you know, I feel like a lot of the uh, good ones has passed away. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, a lot of y'all legends is either retiring or passing away. And I'm like, wait, we, you know, the younger yeah. boys are good, but they just don't have that kick like you and Pondo and Necro. And, you know, they're, they're missing something. Yeah. And I'm not for sure. It's the credibility of being legitimately tough. You know, that's that's the whole thing. Like, even when I when I first got into business, you know, my trainers would tell me, you want to be the guy that's at a bar that looks like nobody will fuck with. You know what I mean? And that's it. You know, that's that's what you want. You want that look. So if you got someone that looks like they shop at, I don't know, Gap for Kids and, like, you know, or Hot Topic, I'm not really going to believe that you can, you know, beat somebody's ass, you know, or especially if you look like you haven't hit the gym, you know, or have any size to you, you know. You If you look at the UFC, if you look at the UFC, you know every single person on that roster, man and woman, can seriously screw somebody up, you know. They could kill somebody if they wanted to, you know. But, yeah, I mean, there's so many people that pass away. It's like, fuck, man, I get pretty – I get depressed and down because a lot of people I team with, you know, are, are gone now. You know, like Eddie Havoc, Brain Damage, J.C. Bailey, you know, Nate Hatred. You know, I was, I was actually good friends with Jimmy Rave, you know, from Wildside. And we worked one time in Ring of Honor. So when he passed, it's like, like, God damn, man. Trent Acid, you know, it's just so Trent, many. Yeah. Trent was so on. many good ones. What was it like being a part of cult fiction? Cult fiction? Cult fiction is cool. You know, the thing is, like, I didn't realize, like, I guess how many fans backed cult fiction up, you know? When I first went to CZW, like, I didn't really, I didn't know about the faction or anything. And, uh, you know, they put me in it. And then, you know, come to find out, there's, like, a big fan base for it, you know? You know, I've been in a lot of factions like Cult Fiction and, you know, Carnage Crew. Uh, you know, the Texas uh, Death Club and NWA Wildside. So. Was working for XPW something that you always wanted to do? Well, the funny thing is, like, I was actually always a fan of XPW. Like, when I first started, XPW was running, 
you know, and a lot of people tend to forget you had top, you know, there's four top promotions. And when I say top four, it's like companies that had TV. You had WWF, you had WCW, you had ECW, you had XPW. You know, those are your four promotions that actually had TV and were running consistent shows. And I was good friends with uh, Ultra Boy Luke, um, Luke Hawks. Um, and he was, you know, working for XPW. And I liked, I liked the wrestling part of it. Not so much all like, you know, the, uh, the, <laughs> like the pornography part. You know, I'd actually, I told Rob Bunny, funny enough, I was like, yeah, I was a big fan of XPW when I was younger. And I would always fast forward through that stuff and then watch the matches. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's each of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> does Rob? I know he has his own sex shop, but does Rob still do porn? Oh. That that's a good thing, I guess. I mean, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I that. He runs a hamburger place, and he runs a head shop that has uh, adult novelty toys. That I'm sure uh, Vince got some of his from. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> in Houston, you know, it's like you know, couples up, and then uh, I was like, "Hey, I had no idea that Vince worked for you." <laughs> you, know what I mean? you, you gotta take things in stride, you know. If you can't joke or laugh about something, you know, what's the point of living? You know what I mean? Exactly. I, I, I mean, when XPW was first going around, I never really watched it. I was too young, and you know, I never really heard of it. And then when he came back, I started watching him, and I watched a lot of the older matches already. And I'm like, I heard stories that he was always into porn, and I was like, nah, it's, you know, Rob ain't that way. And then I watched, I was like, this guy's fucking off the wall. I mean, like. You also got to take it for me, you're really young, but it's like, in that time period, you have to realize, like, what was really popular. You had, like, you know, Jerry Springer or Howard Stern, you know, Girls Gone Wild, you know, shit like that. And that was the time period, you know. It's a big, uh, I guess, you know, rock and roll anti-conformist. Uh, I'm just like, I like, you know, off the wall, real outlaw shit. I think the 90s and the other 2000s is what done it, especially when the internet hit. Yeah. Uh, too, because it, everything came off like more legitimate you know it's yeah. people are so overly sensitive now it's it's pathetic where you have like so much stories that you could literally put into the wrestling business if people would play ball with each other and have like legitimate angles of people's like background or you know, culture and go out there and fight. You know what I mean? That's what sells money. UFC does that really well. You know what I mean? That's why they sell out. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of fucking, there's a lot of punk ass motherfuckers in wrestling now. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I, I believe it. I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen it since I started watching it to now. And you can tell how it, it differed. Back in the day, you had a storyline. This dude's mad at this dude, so they're going to fight like this because he's mad at him because he slept with his girl and they just come up with the storylines and whatever. Now it's like, I'm going to fight you, you going to fight me, and that's it. Nobody, you don't get no storyline to it no more, man. No, you really don't. The thing is, like, the whole point of, like, even a death match is, like, you got to have, like, heat with each other. You got to have a real reason to, you know, want to hurt someone like that. You know, if you're just doing it to do it, it's just... It's shock value, and it takes away from it. ECW was really good at storytelling. And also, I mean, XPW, like they built the stories in Japan, you know, old old Japan. Big Japan, not so much. But uh, Freedoms does a good job of telling the story. I mean, hell, a matter of fact, like Jun Kasai and I had a three-year-long story with, like, the turn of fighting over there and, you know, stemming from, like, fighting in Big Japan and then going to – uh of freedoms. If you don't have a good story, you just look like two madmen and they're swinging at each other. I mean, a good a good story it makes a good death match, in my opinion. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, especially you have guys that have like real chemistry with one another. Yes. Uh, where they can counter counter moves like like this recent match I just had with uh, Remedy. He's legit six seven, and in his boots he's six eight, and he's three hundred and fifty pounds. Like he's huge, you know what I mean? He dwarfed like you know, I'm like a dwarf to him. So what's realistic? Well, I gotta use a weapon to chop this big, you know, tree down. You know, <laughs> I'm using a, yeah. I'm using steel chairs. Now I'm going high flying. I'm doing, you know, uh, 360 tornado DDTs off the air but to the floor. You know, moon sauce. You know, but that's the difference. You know. So, how long have you been growing your hair and your beard? Uh, I started growing my beard. When I was, I think, when I was 18, 18 or 19, and it took a year to get it this long. A year? Oh, my hair out when I was 14. So, it only took you a year to grow your beard that long? Only a year. So, I'm assuming you've done cut your beard and your hair <laughs> since you let it start growing. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I was too. like, you know, I was like, D does he ever cut it or does it? Because, you know, some people got a way of making their long-ass beard look fine, like like it's not long. And I've always noticed that in all of your matches, you've had your big, long beard and your long hair. And I'm like, he has to been growing this since he was a kid. Yeah, for a long time. Well, I mean, the funny thing is, uh, you know, when I was doing all the tournaments, my hair would always get snagged in ball bar, so my hair was so freaking uneven and pulling in a ponytail have like parts sticking out and falling down I was like hell I'm just gonna wear a beanie <laughs> like keep it all down now it's just <laughs> it's my look you know what I mean <laughs> always wearing a beanie but, I mean you know long hair you do, you do like a ponytail or a man or whatever and then you got hair poking up in the sides and shit I told my lady I said I want to you know a ponytail which I can do it but she can do it better, but she done it up in a fucking man bun or whatever the hell you want to call it. So, <laughs> it worked. Right, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, the funny thing is, like, if people that don't know me, they always think I have dreadlocks, which obviously I don't, you know. At one point, I would dreadlock my hair, but then I realized that it's, like, way too much upkeep, and I was like, out oh, of hell with that. I honestly could <laughs> I see you with the dreadlocks. Honestly. A little, a little time where I was thinking about it. A small period of time. <laughs> Maybe a, a man bun? Maybe. And that's a yeah. fine line. Yeah, exactly. But dreadlocks, cornrows, I mean, even short hair, I could not see you. I'm sorry. Like, that would just, I don't know. I wouldn't know how to feel. Like, yeah, dude, I like... Yeah, I'll tell you the thing, like, so, from age 11 to uh, 14, I was in Taekwondo, so I did martial arts, and uh, they were really strict, you know, you have to have short hair, you know, you know, look clean, you know, but as soon as I quit doing that, I was like, ah, the hell with this, I'm growing my hair out. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I, started I, I started letting my hair grow out, passed away my father, so it was, uh, she passed away in March of 21, 2021, and then in June, I started letting it grow out, and now it's probably down to about, right, well, you've seen it, like, probably my shoulders, and my yeah. son's hair, his hair is probably to his back, mid-back, so, we're Native American, we also got Norse in us, Norse Viking in us, so, and uh, we got New Zealand warrior family, so, it's just really common for us to have long hair. Funny thing is, hey. so both sides of my family, there's Cherokee blood. My mom and dad's side. Yeah. I have Cherokee from both sides, and then on my dad's side, I have Blackfoot. Oh, wow. And um, I also have like three or four more types from my dad alone. Like, he, is dark. he is dark. And as he ages more, everybody's like, you know, thinks he's Hispanic. And my mom, when my mom was with me, they're like, is he Hispanic? My mom was like, no, 
is he, you know, mixed or black? And my mom's like, no, he's Native American. That's just how dark he gets. Yeah. And Squirt will tell you, like, as he's aged, his hair turns silver. And my lady's like, I can see the silver hair in your hair already. And I'm like, I know I'm Native, but don't go promoting it here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Funny, the cool thing is, so when I first started uh, wrestling, in Louisiana, they have wrestling shows that was on the, the reservations, you know, which is actually a big really part of. That's Funny enough, that's how I met uh, Ronnie Mac, who's a, uh, oh, Ronnie Mac, who's Red Dog. I met him on a, an Indian reservation. So. That's fucking awesome. He's half, he's half uh, I forget what, I think he's half Blackfoot, if I'm not mistaken, but he's definitely, he's half, he's half Native American. Fucking cool. So I've actually asked you this question yesterday in the DMs. I know you forge weapons. Do you have like an online store and how much do you charge for the stuff you make? Well, I don't have an online store. Everything right now is just, you know, someone DMs me and they tell me what they want and then, you know, I work with them on prices, you know. But um, actually, I have some right here. Like this is the one I just finished. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. So they want this to cut onions and avocados. That is fucking awesome. So this knife right here, this knife alone was is two fifty. That's what it sold for. And the thing is, like, it's all about timing. You know, this these take a long time to make. Like here's another one. Uh, this is the one that has the. The skull and the scroll etch work on That's it. the one that I like. That is fucking awesome. That's cool. That's so yeah. cool. That's fucking cool. I do all the leather work as well. Everything's all here, hand done, handmade. That's fucking awesome. But it just depends, you know. Honestly, like when I first started doing this, you know, prices were we're obviously lower, but material costs on making knives and getting high carbon steel, it's gone up. Shit, I want to say like three times the amount of what it used to be. And uh, all the steel I get is uh, from Oklahoma. Oh, shit. So, yeah, that's what I was uh, talking to you about yesterday was one and uh, I'm going to get the money together and actually have you make one, but I want you know, on one side of it, I want you to put, you know, your logo and your uh, name on it so it states who the hell it comes from. Because okay. honestly, you know, okay, that's fucking awesome. I like that one. And this that's one, this, one. And this one actually, it's uh, it has. I don't know if you can see, but it's got has brass liners, and it has that artwork on the back on the spine. But this is actually uh, zebra wood. That comes from West Africa, and then the pins are whole holes with brass. Oh, that's fucking cool, dude. The answer you can't really see, but you know it. It goes straight through. That's fucking awesome. I'm trying to get better at doing them. You know, I've been doing them for a while, and I still want to learn Damascus. I just haven't had the chance to try it out. Right. You know, it's in brass. <sighs> no, here's the she. Damn! This is, this is a kukri. This, this one's a pretty penny. <laughs> so, so uh, I think I asked you, do you do pocket knife so? Do I do what? Do I do pocket knives? Yeah. I, I haven't tried them yet. I've, I've watched the uh, tutorials on how to do it. Um, no one's ever asked me to make one, so I just, you know, never bothered. Uh, you're actually the first person to ask me about pocket knife. I mean, I'm sure I could figure it out. I definitely want to make in butterfly knives, you know, that'd be cool. A pocket knife for it? Because I like pocket knives, so I really don't put them on my side or whatever. I more or less put them on my pocket. 
But I think it'll be fucking cool to like have you, you know, forge a knife or whatever. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Hit him up and have a fucking knife made. It's not gonna be cheap, but you're yeah. taking time. He's taking time out of his schedule to make this for you, and it's coming with pride and love from Masada. <laughs> so you know you're not gonna go outside, stick it into a box, and it's gonna snap in half in less than five seconds. Yeah, seriously. This one here's a tanto I made. That is fucking cool. Ooh. As you can see, he will put the edge on it however the hell you want to bet. Guarantee it. It's going to come out out of that box when you get it out of that box. Sharp as. Oh, man, I like that. That is awesome to say. <laughs> oh, that is cool. I like that. That is dope. I'm, like, I'm in my shop, and so you can see, like, all the skulls, like, over here. Like, I do make skull statues. Have my, uh, you know, dust collector, like right there over here, bunch of different like belts, and then my welder, jewel press, both my forges, and then new anvil, 135 pound anvil or 32 pound, I'm not sure exactly, but the suckers have it, and then 100 pound anvil. So yeah, I can like I have everything to do Damascus, um, you know. From what I've watched, like, that's really time-consuming. Matter of fact, like, that kukri knife I showed you, like, that took over two weeks. Okay. So, you Maybe. see... All right, they're knocking us, like, eight hours, and it's like, holy crap. You know, I'm nowhere near that fast. <laughs> like, not yet, anyhow. He's probably taking time. I don't really know, but he's probably taking time from his wife and his kids to make this for y'all. And... I <laughs> This is just yeah. my thing. But also, I too, mean, so check this out real quick. So this right here, metal box. Did all the fab work on this. Here's the grinder. Then I have metal brakes. So now I have, like, a whole, like, nine yards to do anything, like, metal fabrication-wise. Cool. Yeah. If we have a zombie apocalypse, I'm going, I'm going to Masada's house. <laughs> the ball, ball, baseball bat ready for anybody. Seeing <laughs> <laughs> how you've wrestled for 24 years and stuff, been in the business for 24 years, what advice would you give an up-and-comer breaking into the business? Uh, honestly, get proper training. Really, really research on who's training you. And when you know somebody that's been around, like, you know, pick their brain. You know what I mean? Listen, don't just watch matches and then, like, rip their stuff off. Like, really talk to someone and then ask them, you know, what they need to improve on. You know, I would always, like, pick veterans' brains on uh, what I need to work on and, you know, just getting better. You know, take pride in your work, you know, and uh, obviously protect the business. All right, there's some shady characters in wrestling business. Yeah, there actually is. Just from... It's like people... Like, people will say this about me. Like, I'm probably the most honest person in wrestling, and I don't pull punches. Like, if I don't like you, like, everybody's going to know I don't like you. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? There's a lot of... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I know... You, what is your hobbies outside of the ring? I know you like to forge, but do you have any other hobbies? Um, no, I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I do bone carving. I just like making things, honestly. You know, I've always been hands-on with everything. Uh, I'd say that's basically, those are, those are my deal. That's my, that's what I love doing. Hell yeah. So are you strictly XPW, or would you go elsewhere? Oh, man, XPW is home. You know, like... I like what Rob's doing, and I back the product. And if he says, like, hey, I got issues with this guy, like, he, he don't want you going over there, like, all right, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I understand that. I understand that. When you wrestled in Japan, did you ever capture any championship? Uh, where, when I wrestled where? In Japan. In Japan. In Japan. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't hold any belt in, in Japan. Like, uh... 
Yeah, I just won won the tournament. And then uh, that's the thing that was weird, like with Big Japan. Big Japan wasn't really keen on putting like championship belts on gaijin talent, which stems from like when Zandig was over there. Uh, apparently, Big Japan, EW, like had a big, big but they really, as far as like, but recently, I guess they they changed changed things around. I saw Pondo just won the death match belt, and then, uh, I've never met the guy personally. But Drew Parker at one point has had, I guess, the Freedom Belt and the Big Japan Belt. I could yeah. be wrong about that. I think he had both. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Because like when Necro and I were over there, like they're not putting their championship belt on him. Like <laughs> it ain't happening. Like freaking Ito Ruji's like. Freaking Bill Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what country do you think has the most painful contraptions? The most painful contraptions. And everything pretty much hurts and sucks. Uh, I would say with innovation, uh, probably like combat zone wrestling, but in Big Japan has some cool stuff. That's like one of the things I always learned about Japan. Like when they do death matches, it's all if it's a light tube death match, it's a light tube death match. You know, in the United States it's like a cluster of just a bunch of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just like this is this is light tube but well it's got a gusset plate, it has like thumbtacks, it's got all this other crap in it. And I don't know, I, t- I think it takes away when you put too much stuff into a match. You know, you can give me a, like a Bob Arp baseball bat and a shopping cart, and that's all I need. And I guarantee, yeah. like, we're talking about that more than guys just breaking light tubes over their heads. But CZW gets uh, a lot of credit for uh, the innovation of the like, cage of death. Those are cool. They were always really cool. Like, they were really bad, like, the way they set them up. You know, it was like a W or wing, you know. Uh, Cage of Death, I like the I like Cage of Death because they always bring in something different. They always make it look different. And um, DJ said that he was supposed to be bringing back Cage of Death once he finds a building big enough. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, that's not a whole thing. Like I don't like New Jersey, Philly, and New York used to be really really good for like finding buildings for pro wrestling. And I don't know if that's because of like COVID, if that's what screwed that up. But lately, like, the buildings that I'm seeing that the shows are ran out of, like they're not very Im- Im- impressive. You know, it's like, oh man, this is really small. You know, always at the ETW arena, but I don't know if it's like overpriced and rented or what. I don't know if anybody's even running out of it now. Yeah. I know for the long time they were running out of it because they wanted to turn it into like a music hall slash restaurant and bar. And uh, I think they did that for a while. And then they, when they opened it back, is when I run. It was. Who was it? It was DJ and I against uh, O'Neal and uh, Tremont. Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, I've seen that one. I mean, they did a lot of different things. Like they changed, changed the building up. It was really nice, but you're really taking a lot of money out if you uh, if you don't have like boxing in there or pro wrestling. Yeah, we was talking. Man, you was talking about uh, cutting DJ do it on the farm, and you said it'd be a pain in the ass to do it. Yeah, because of the wind factor and stuff. <laughs> the thing is, like, death. Like, I don't know how they they. They were on the DVDs or if you were watching it on the live feed paper views, but and it takes almost an hour to set those things up. And typically you're talking about serious like trucks bringing all that, that equipment in and having like a crew of like 10 to 15 guys setting it up. It's a lot of work. Yes, TOD is probably easier. Yeah. I just don't see how they could want to bring the cage all the way from Philadelphia or New Jersey, wherever that stuff is in storage, and then all the way over to Delaware 
and then have to do the cap and then take it all the way back. I mean, that, that's just a pain in the ass. Yeah, that's understandable. Is there anyone you would like to call out? Call out? Call out? Yeah. I mean, there's little guys I wouldn't mind getting in the ring with. <laughs> like, you know, What's like, what, what that hasn't happened is Moxley. You know, like, that's never happened. happened. And, you know, I, I said yeah. some things and then I messaged him because I literally talked to him in L.A. Because he used the like I said, bro, if you ask me, I'm cool. But I told him about it because he had done it. And then, like, I'm like, hey, can you not do that? Well, shit, they go to England and he does it again. I'm like, all right, well, that's a big fuck you to me. You know what I mean? I literally just had a talk to you and you, you agreed, and now you're doing it anyway. Well, you know, hey, you know, we'll fuck you right back. But, uh, and that was the thing, too. Like, even when I wrestled Atticus at GCW, that was one of the things that was agreed on that I would eventually wrestle Joey Janela and then uh, Moxley. Yeah, and, and so, it's like whatever. Yeah, didn't Sammy do the uh, skiers too? Yeah, he did. I mean, the thing is, he had called me and he asked, and uh, uh, doing Lucha Underground, and I told him, like, yeah, I, I mean, you know. Put me over yeah. to the office and then, like, let me come in. You know, that would be cool. Like, if you use the skewers and then I'm coming in to get revenge on you or, or something. something. Yeah. You know, he had my blessing to do it. But when they did it, you know, Matt Striker, oh, Masada like. Now, the thing, you don't know who I am, but you don't watch, like, you know, the end of the wrestling. You would think that he came up with it, you know? So that's, like, the kind of the thing where, I don't know. Get too personal. Like I spent, I lived in Japan for eight years. I wrestled there consistently for twelve. I spent a lot of time away from family and friends, and you know, a lot of family. Well, family and friends have passed away. Like I miss funerals. I miss holidays. So I went over there and repaid my dues when I already paid my dues in the United States for someone who has an in on a TV company just to take my shit and steal it. So. Uh, that's making me more money. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that's understandable. Like, you know, if you're going to at least not ask the fucking man to steal mm -hmm. his shit, at least, hey, you know, after the match, hey, I stole this from Masada, you know, get the man some fucking credit. I mean, you did steal it from me. I mean, the thing is, I even got Sammy. It's like, you know, put like a like exile a, patch on your gear or something. Like, give me some, like, recognition. You know what I mean? Because I'm not. You're getting paid for this. I'm not. And I'll tell you what, the only guy who has, like, my real blessing of doing it is Atticus. And Atticus, you know, messaged me. He was a big fan of mine. And uh, he asked me, and he had my blessing on doing it. And he did business. Like, we wrestled at GCW. Then we wrestled at Circle Six. And that's a thing, too. Like, when people steal it, it just looks like shit. <laughs> like... It most of the time, it just look good. It's like you'll see all of them, and then they like two of them stick in, and the rest of them fall out. Yeah, <laughs> but man, uh, I'm very open to tell you where me and Squirrel got the gear thing from that I done to him. We got it from Masada. Um, he just recently accepted my friend's request, so I did not ask him. But I'm not stealing it from him. We done it in honors of him. Because, honestly, that's probably the last time we're going to do it. it. We might. If y'all do it later, that's cool. You know what I mean? I have no problem with that. But the thing is, a lot of people don't get it. Like, fans of mine tag me in this stuff. And then it's like, it's people I don't even know, never worked with. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then you got on a, online talk shit because I voiced my opinion on something. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not going to say that's in my face. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, if Squirrel was to volunteer and say, I'll take a whole bundle of tubes at 1,500 subs or some shit, I'm still going to ask Masada, even though I'm paying for them. He's the one that brought them into death matches. So, you know, if he didn't bring them in, we would have never had the idea to take skirts to the head or the arm or whatever. So we got to thank him for that. That's like the thing, like, you know, some people, I mean, one, like, 
So when fans who are new to death matches and they don't know the history of anything or really respect the wrestlers and the, the history, um, you know, when people are, you know, guys are punching, what are you going to say? They're ripping you off then, too? And it's like, no, it's obviously different, dumbass. But uh, uh, weapons, when Mr. Pogo passed away, I made a sickle, and out of respect, for him, I used it. You know, only one time, because he recently just passed away. He was a good friend of mine. Of course, of course, I understand that. You know, like, pay tribute to him or, you know, give him your honors or whatever. I understand that. That's respect in my book. So, uh, could we, kind of a stupid question, um, could we ever see you back in ICW NHB? ICW NHB? Nah, probably not. Uh, no, nah, there's like too much heat with uh, ICW and XPW. I understand that. I mean, like, I may be wrong, but I think I've only seen you in like two shows, and that was one with Akira, and then the one with uh, Neil Diamond Cutter. Yeah, right. yeah, when they were in Texas. I feel like the thing too, like, I'm not really, like, the chains look, they're different, you know what I mean, but... You go into the match and you don't have no rope breaks and you can't run and hit the chains that actually like run like ropes. I mean, that just takes away from a lot of things that you can do. I, mean, I guess in some in some aspects it's cool to think outside the box, but you know, I just I wasn't really too much a fan of it. I understand that a lot of wrestlers I don't think is a fan of the chains like uh, Jack Harrop. I don't know if you know him. He's uh, Iceman's son over there in England. I've asked him his thoughts on the chain, and he's like, I can't get no leverage in the chains like I can the ropes. And I'm but like... You hit they stop. You know, it's not like steel cables or actual ring ropes that, you know, spring them off. And if you're a high flyer, man, you can't do anything, you know? Honestly, when you get, when you get the momentum to run and you, like, hit those chains... It's going to destroy your adrenaline and your momentum because you're going to hit your fucking back. You're getting more. And, more. Uh, y'all two can correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't really see no Irish whip in the chains. No. no you really. If you do, I feel bad for that wrestler, even though y'all are trained for it. The next day, how bad are y'all bruised from those chains alone? Well, like I said, like I was only in the ring one time with those, and I never hit the chains, but I could just tell, like, you know, Kira has been doing it for a long time, so I asked him, like, well, can you do this off of them? He's like, dude, they have no spring. I was like, well, fuck, man. All right, guess we'll just go out there and uh, go out there and do our thing. <laughs> I mean, I like Danny's idea, but if you make them too tight, you're not going to be able to do nothing. But if you make them too loose, you're still not going to be able to do nothing. So, my question is, why did he start the change? I think, honestly, it's just something to be different. You know, everybody's looking to do something different, differently and stick out. I mean, in a lot of aspects, it does stick out. I mean, we're talking about it right now, but some ideas are good, some ideas are bad. Out of all the places you wrestled internationally, which place did you get the loudest uh, crowd reaction at? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, honestly, every place, and not sound try to sound egotistical, but every place I've gone, I've always gotten a big Masada chant. You know, especially like Oregon Hall in Tokyo, or going in like WXW in Dusseldorf, Germany. You know, I've always got a big, big reaction. Um, I mean, that's a good question. Like, honestly, I would say probably Japan. But, you know, it's like you got Philly, you know what I mean? You got CZ, Philly fans, and then just the American fan base. You know. So, who is on your death match or hardcore Mountain Rushmore? It's definitely one of them. Terry Funk, Onita. Cactus. Ooh. And I guess like when you go 
more of the newer guys, but not the the super old school guys. Like Zandig was one of them. Uh, you know, but Zandig does some really crazy shit. Like, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not going two stories up on a building getting thrown off of it. That doesn't appeal to me at all. The, <laughs> fucking, the, the hook spot when he was in the modifications back in the day and they hunking, hung him and made him look like uh, the crow. And they fucking hung him. Oh, God. Uh, I got a strong stomach. And uh, uh, yeah. I can see that shit. But yeah. the fact that it was like, I watched it and a lot of people walked out and, like, they wasn't expecting it. And I was watching the show and I wasn't even expecting it. I'm like, you know, at first I thought, I watched the show, then I watched the behind the scenes or whatever. That he planned it out, and I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Are they actually, are they actually on purposely trying to hurt this man and shit? It was like, mind blowing, honestly. That's the thing. Like he and Schlack are the only two wrestlers I've known that have done that. The meat hooks in their back and suspended. But then also, if you go into Ring of Honor, uh, it's a really cool visual. Oh, but Jimmy Jim, uh, was cutting the promo on the Briscoes, and I forget which one was hanging upside down, but he's like on him, and it's like being blood on him. Like, literally. Sting actually hung like at one time in a TNA. Oh, did he? Yes, I was fucking, I had to be like four or five years old, and he was more like laying like this away instead of like this away, and he was like laying up on the rafters back when I was TNA in the six-sided ring. So I say 04 through 06, it was around in that time, and my mom said that he looked like Michael Myers, and my uncle said, no, that's Sting. And she's like, well, he looks like Michael Myers to me, and I went in there, and I was like, that's fucking cool and hardcore and stuff. So my grandfather's a fan of yours and my grandmother, we used to watch you before she passed away. And uh, one of the reasons why I started my channel, there's a few reasons, but she always told me, she said, if I pass away before you get the chance, she said, I want you to click with Masada. She said, I like Masada. I think he's good luck. And I'm like, come on, man. She's like, come on, though. No. He's a nice kid. He looks like a nice guy. I was like, he looks like he'll fuck you up. <laughs> and my grandmother loved you. She liked Nick Gage. And my grandmother, squirrel knows my grandmother. We all called her Granny. I call her Nanny, though. And she loved, you know, hardcore shit. She grew up watching wrestling. And uh, she was a fan of yours. She was a fan of Gage's. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to, I know she's watching down on me, and I know she's loving this interview, and I'm achieving my dreams, and I got one of my personal favorite legends on the channel right now, so thank you for coming, and, you know. Brian hit me up, and he said that you started this, and he was like, you know, you could say no. I was like, no, I've never told anybody no for a, a podcast, and, you know, run uh, down to some history. I was like, yeah, I definitely, I definitely want to do it. Yes, sir. What was up with after you burnt your face? Rob took the XBW belt. The thing is, like when I went to the ICU and then went to the burn unit, um, they told me it's gonna take like a full year to heal up. And uh, you know, stretch my neck. I had to do all this stuff because the skin's like super tight. And even the healing process, you have to do that because honestly, it would just split right open. And if you watch, like, when I wrestled Alex, I think it was, I remember it was a month later when I, I wrestled with him. Uh, when he was stopping on my hand, it started instantly blistering up. Because it's almost like skin, you know, it's not enough. And then, like, a risk of getting, like, infections. You know, so that's sort of uh, what the doctor told me. You don't want to risk going out there, getting hurt, and getting, like, a staph infection or MRSA, you know. So... So that was only the reason for dropping the, dropping the belt. Well, now that the eight-man gauntlet is open, or seven-man, now that Necro's in there, I'd like to see you get in there and win your belt back, or both of them, actually. Actually, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> what is that? 
that one, if I'm not mistaken. I would love to see you win the belt back. Oh, like a death match title. But the funny uh, thing is, I tell people, like, that's one of those belts that you don't want. <laughs> don't want to do a there and do death matches every, every show, every event you're on. Yeah, that's true. That's understandable. So, do you consider yourself a juggalo? Juggalo? I like IC. I never was really that like, deep into them. You know what I mean? I listened to them when I was a teenager. I mean... I was, I've watched a lot of your old matches, as I said before, and I was like, you know, I kind of get that vibe, but I don't see him being, like, all into being a juggalo. Yeah. No, not really. I mean, I respect music. You know, I'm, I'm more of a, a southern metalhead. You know, I grew up listening to, like, bands like Pantera and, like, you know, I Hate God and CEO Sticky Goat War, Acid Bath. Just like from like Louisiana and Texas, like that's always been my scene. Matter of fact, tonight, like I'm gonna go to a, a concert. One of my good friends is actually playing. I haven't seen in years, so it's kind of yeah. cool being back in the United States and not being in Japan or being like international traveling because man, I miss out on so much. I haven't seen my friend in over twenty, years, so I'm gonna see him tonight. So that's cool. Oh, yeah? Following up on the Juggalo question, have you ever or would you wrestle at the gathering? I have. I have. I've wrestled at two of the gatherings. Gathering. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> like, I, for some reason, for some odd reason, I always got stuck on the on the fairgrounds. <laughs> like, I hate it. <laughs> yeah, it sucked. Uh, is there anywhere to watch that? Uh, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, there was like the match it was Paul's uh, rest his soul. That a guy I team with not here anymore. Um it was us against Moshpit Mike and I forget the other guy's name. But that was on YouTube at one point, but I think they took it off. Would it be yeah. Chewy Martinez? What's up? Would it be Chewy Martinez and Moshpit Mike? Uh, I never wrestled Chewy Martinez, uh but it was Mike and like I said, I forget the other guy's name. I want to say it was Elfview. I don't. I can't really remember. Yeah, I don't think I know his name. So, um, who gave you a run for your money? For my money? I don't know. Necker and I always really stiff on each other. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, it would have to be Kasai. Kasai's up there. I mean, honestly, like, as going move for move, like, Danny Havoc, June Kasai, you know, I've wrestled a lot of strong guys. Uh, uh, dude, I mean, Jeff Cobb, like, definitely really picked me up like I was a freaking baby. Like, that dude's, like, super strong. Like, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment in your career so far? Honestly, just making making my name, you know, being established and sticking sticking true to my guns. You know what I mean? I've always been the guy that you know marched to the beat of my own drum. You know, and I even tell Sabu because I always looked up to him. It's like you know, always follow your career. Like your attitude towards the business, the first thing you told me was sorry. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've closed quite a few doors, but you know, at the end of the day, it's like you gotta, you gotta keep, you gotta be yourself, you know. Yeah. So I've had this question for a while, and it was always one of my questions. And you're gonna ask Squirrel, how did you get the nickname the Ultraviolet Beast? Honestly, I don't know. I think. Larry Legend came up with that, honestly. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Larry, I think Larry came up with that because he was calling me the international best superstar. And then it turned to that to the old violent beast. But I think Larry Legend came up with both of those. I respect it's that. It's just Masada, you know, and like, you know, people think that's a, if they don't know the Masada, it's a mountain in Israel where. You know, an empire enslaved, like, uh, 
the Israelites at the top of that mountain. Instead of like being enslaved by Rome, they committed genocide and they all killed themselves. Uh, name wow. them. Yeah, well, there you go. The beast and then the international deathmatch superstar. We all just got a history lesson. Well, I did. I did too. <laughs> and I'm a history fanatic. So, do you have a go-to TV show or movie? Uh, yeah. yeah. So much now. Like, I used to, you know, it's going to sound really funny. One of my favorite shows is Extreme Home Makeup. <laughs> I always thought it was. I always thought that was like the coolest thing. Like, you know, when they're gonna do something good for the community of like people that have, you know obviously have helped a lot of people or you know suffered through some uh, houses destroyed or they lost their house or whatever. But for them to be able to pick their mind and things that they enjoyed and actually make them, like that's cool. That's one of the things I love about making things. Like when somebody hits me up. They're like, hey, I want to knock this big, or I want to catch you of a skull, or any kind of joke for them to actually see what I do. Because I take pictures of every step that I'm doing, and I send it to the customer. You know, so they see the little detail I'm doing, and they get the time frame of what I'm doing. It. So I always thought that was really cool. But Fortune Star shows I like watching. Um, I don't really, I haven't really got too much invested in any TV shows recently. Yeah, I just, I don't know, I, just, I don't really have time for it. Honestly, you look like one of those guys that will sit down and watch, like, Sons of Anarchy or the Mayans, MC. The funny thing is, I didn't watch Sons of Anarchy until uh, Hamas told me in referred to Philly, and he's like, you look, you're Opie. And I was like, what the fuck is an Opie? He's like, hey, what's up, Opie? And I was like, huh? And he's like, I've never, I yes, I'll see it. it. I never watched. I never watched Sons of Anarchy, and then once he told me that, I started watching. I was like, "Oh, okay. I guess I could see some uh, similarities." <laughs> I, I see it. I see it. I see it. Yes. Yes. I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. Funny enough. <laughs> but yeah, I, some. I don't know. Like, no slang. He was calling me. <laughs> how how many times have you been in Japan? Yeah. Like, I honestly couldn't even tell you. Like, I have a passport that's pretty much stacked and full of every time I've gone over there. But the thing is, too, I started living over there. And the thing, when guys go over there and do tours, I wasn't doing tours. I was going over there doing a thing called series. The series would go over there for like three months to a year, um, which is, you know, brutal. But um, you know, a lot of people ask like ask me before like, why did you go from working Ring of Honor to doing trial matches with TNA uh, to be and go from those promotions and then go straight to Blood and Guts in Japan? I mean, honestly, I was always a fan of Deathmatch Wrestling and FMW was shut down, so no options. Big Japan, you know. So I wanted to make a name, doing something, like, like really established, you know. Yeah, I was uh, talking to my grandfather, and I told him that you would have been in ROH, and he said, well, you probably left because, you know, the H shit. And I'm like, well, you know, Masada, he likes death matches. And he said, well, that explains it. He wants, you know, my grandfather's like, well, he wants the blood and the gore. That's Masada. Okay. And, my grandfather, he don't really know the names unless he really watches them. He knows the faces. I can put on TV right now and he go, there's Masada. Or there's Matt Tremont. And I'm like, you know, he'll get some of them. And my mom, she has a bad thing. Her and my wife, they have a bad thing for nicknaming wrestlers like, um, shit. The guy over there in Australia, is it Gore? Squirrel? Yeah. I don't know how the hell he got his name. Something about his trunks or something. But we was all chilling watching Deathmatch Down Under one day. My mom looks up from doing her crossword book and she goes, Hey, there's Snuff Daddy Little Peter. I go, what the fuck? We all bust out laughing. She, 
she can't remember names, so she nicknames them. My wife, she calls uh, Seek of Way and uh, Meat Art Stream. I was that's hot sauce and um, sweet and sour. And uh, she calls uh, Raju E2, I think. She calls him uh, hot sauce. She, I'm like, they got names. She's like, well, I can't remember their names, so I'm going to name them. She's got soy sauce, and then my mom. My mom calls uh, uh, Casanova Valentine. That's caveman. I'm like, they got wrestling names. She's like, yeah, what I call them. I'm like, you just can't go up. Yeah, what up, Snuff Daddy Little Peter? How you doing today? I'm like, this name's Gord. Tell me to do commentary for uh, for uh, Icy for the Juggalos. <laughs> Because when they talk about, like Strangle Mania, they would just like make up the wrestlers' names. <laughs> like, and, here's and, and, <laughs> like, my mom has uh, the weakest stomach on a person I've ever seen, so she really don't like death matches. She don't even like blood, and she when she she'll watch at it, but she won't watch it like we do. And she'll just look up and go like, name some fucking stupid nickname to a wrestler. And I'm like, what? She's like. I'm like, no, we're just going to call him by his wrestling name. Yeah. <laughs> when you wrestle one of the 440 boys, does it linger in the back of your head that more is going to come out? Come uh, out? Like, you mean come out and, like, attack me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's always in the back of my mind. They're crazy. <laughs> they run in groups. I mean, like, I watched you in GCW against Atticus, and I seen Bobby Beverly versus you in Circle Six. And um, when you and Atticus went, went out at Circle Six, and then the rest of Four Four come out, I'm like, you know, I watched that match two or three times. I'm like, I gotta ask him what what's his, what, how does he feel? You know, what lingers in the back of his mind when all these guys are coming out on him, even though he's a big guy. What runs through your head when you're in front of, like, that many of them? Oh, if it's about to go down, it's about to go down. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, honestly, there's nothing you can do. I mean, like... Tell me when I go. <laughs> That's what I'm going for. I mean, do the best you can. I mean... It, I think that's where 440 gets over on a lot of people is they... they have so many of them that have just come out of fucking woodwork. I mean, you got like Bobby, you got Eric, you got Gregory, you know, Atticus, Otis, you got fucking Eddie. It's like the thing though, it's like Ohio has always had like a lot of really good wrestlers come out of there. You That's know, true. Uh, Les Thatcher's done really well at uh, at training training wrestlers. And uh you know, as far as what I, I could tell, as from what I know, it's like majority of schools out there are like legitimate schools. You know what I mean? So, my old lady is actually from Ohio, and I fuck with her all the time. I've been like, you know, your daddy's Eddie only. I see it. And it, she'll get so fucking mad. And I don't really see where she looks like Eddie only, but I pick on her about the stupidest shit. Like, I'll be like, there goes Uncle Cousin Atticus. She'll fucking get mad as shit. And it's just something like Ohio. My grandmother's from Ohio, so. And we're, me and my grandfather and my uncle and my mom, we're from Kentucky, so. She's the oddball here. My grandmother passed away, and, they, and my kids are from Kentucky, so she's the, the Buckeye that sticks out with us. So, you know, we fuck with her about where she's from. Yeah, i I tell you what, like, Ohio... Ohio is one of those places you like to visit, but definitely wouldn't want to live there. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a blue collar. Like, definitely blue collar. And the crazy thing is, like, a lot of military weapons get built in Ohio, you know, for the military, which is crazy. I mean, my mother-in-law is from Ohio. Like, basically all of her family's from Ohio. So, like, but... Personally, like you just said, I would not live in that state to save my soul. No, to anybody watching, nothing against Ohio. I've been there. My aunt, I have family from Ohio. My aunt owns a farm down there in a 10-bedroom house. 
Yeah. So I'm not too. I've stayed there, but as far as living there, no, no, no. There's that. There, I just can't click with that damn state. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Like their houses, they're huge, and it, the cost of living there was is really cheap, from my understanding. At one point in time, I was considering living there, and I stayed at uh, Dave and Chris's house, and he had some students there, and we went out one night, and you know, I was just kind of trying to get a feel for the town, and I was like, you know, the hell with this, man. I'm going back to Texas, or I'll go, I'll go live in Mexico before I live here. <laughs> so I, mean- I left. <laughs> I went to Florida for like three days to a week, and I couldn't stay down in Florida. My nose is really bad, and that's one reason why it looks like it does. And I hear a lot of shit like, you know, you got a big nose on this and that and the other, and I'm like, honestly, I was born without a cartilage. I had one specially made. It got shattered in a fight, and the boy was taller than me. Like, he was like, I was short in middle school. Like, squirrel will tell you. He helped raise me, and I was like four foot five maybe, and this motherfucker's like five foot. So he pins me up against the blackboard, and he breaks my nose. You know, what am I supposed to do? He shatters my cartilage. Yeah. That was just made. I spent my whole summer laid up in the bed, and I'm like, you know, the next day, my well, that night, my grandfather looked at me, and he says, I'll give you two options. You go back to school. I don't care how you do it. You make him fucking pay. Or I'm going to beat your ass when you go. Went to school, looked at my best friend. He tossed me a chair, one of those chairs, busted the boy's head wide open. Went to the office. His mom come up and she said, I'd like to press charges. My grandmother said, okay, then you press charges. I'll press charges for attempted murder because he just had his brand new cartilage fixed and shattered. So yeah. she changed her mind. I don't want to press charges. Well, they took me to the nose doctor, another nose specialist. So what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to go in, cut the bridge of my nose completely off, make a cart, size it up, and then put my nose back on and do skin draft from my butt or my thighs and, you know, redo it all. And then he said I'd be down for about six months. That includes the healing process, the rehab, the the whole nine yards. My nose is like, I can probably, I can move my nose all the way to the either side of my face. I can pull it halfway up. It's really bad. And I'm like, and then he goes, oh, it's a 50-50 chance. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? He's like, well, it could work. It couldn't work. And also, you can die in the surgery and you can't die. And I'm like, yeah, that's you. Not- <laughs> I'm like, my nose don't work too well, but I can still smell. I can still do other things. Fuck you. Leave my nose alone. <laughs> You know who Bob Lewis is, uh, MMA fighter? His nose is actually like rubber or silicone, and they take out the cartilage and replace it with silicone. So he literally can push his nose and it goes flat into his face. But that probably sounds like a better option for you than taking skin grafts from, from your rear end and putting it on your face. I mean, the <laughs> weird thing is, like, I was told that I'll be blowing out when when he broke my nose, he shattered my cartilage into a million pieces. Some of it went actually, I don't know, like it went to the back of my head or some shit. So he said that no matter how many surgeries I have or whatever, they will not be able to get all the cartilage out. I'll be blowing it out of my nose for the rest of my life. And not trying to be nasty or nothing, but the first surgery, done enough, and I'm good. But sorry about the little rant. No, that's fine. Like honestly, I would, I would talk to a different doctor, get a second opinion. There's always, there's always different options. And um, yeah. so, I mean, I've I've blown pieces of my cartilage out, and it gets to be, it's not bad. I mean, it is bad, but you know, I I look at it like it don't really bother me. Although sometimes my nose will fucking hurt, and I'll go like that. And my wife's like, "What's wrong?" And I'm like. My fucking nose. And I'll get nosebleeds and shit. But when I went to Florida, oh, my God, where it's so dry down there. And you got the tropical storm, and then you got the heat, and then you got the tropical storm, and then you got the heat. I I couldn't do it. You got mosquitoes and all kinds of insects that could kill you. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) could we ever see the faces of death resurface? I don't know. You know what I mean? That really just, we'll see. 
You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's not, but you never know. <laughs> Honestly, you and Slack is like my top two. I love y'all, and I, I got a lot of favorites, so I said it in an older video, you know. Don't let anybody tell you how many favorites you can have. I mean, y'all y'all ain't – I'm sorry. I look at y'all like y'all are gods or some shit because y'all are in here literally – a lot of wrestlers have said, you don't know if you're going to you know, get back out of that ring. You can die in that ring. Yeah. I mean, you can in technical wrestling too, but look at what y'all are doing. Look at Nick Gage, for example. And so, like, I love all the wrestlers, but I'd love to see their faces of death resurface. You just see recently, I think it's CML, or it's either CMLL or AAA. One of the luchadors did a running, and he was trying to spring off the second rope, and his right leg went through. And then he went forward and it snapped his knee. So you want to fucking slam? That, that's making the rounds right now. That's that's what people are talking about. It's like, yeah, it's it's a dangerous business, you know, for sure. I mean, like, it can happen in technical wrestling, but look at death matches alone. Your face, Mickey Knuckles and the Angel of Death tournament with their leg, Nick Gage, uh, Murdoch and Carnage Cup when he split his shoulder. I mean, I've seen some stuff in technical wrestling, like uh, when they did, got a hold of um, Buddy Murphy or whatever. I call him Mater Murphy, and they lit him up with the Kindle sticks. But, I mean, come on, what really bad happens in regular wrestling besides a broken arm or maybe a tore ACL? I know that shit hurts, but. Hey, that, that's still, that's really bad. <laughs> like, I mean, not... I know that shit's career ending, and it could really hurt you, but. <sighs> I guess the thing is with death matches is you don't know. Yeah. And and the way that y'all get shit on, excuse my French, but the way that y'all get shit on, well, y'all aren't professional, y'all backyard, and this and that and the other. And like I tell everybody, you step in there. Let's see how long you last. Yeah. And don't go up against nobody like fucking <laughs> some small guys. Go up against somebody like Masada, Tank. Fucking necro butcher. If you last longer than five minutes and you're a regular guy like me, I'll give you a hundred fucking dollars. Right. But you ain't gonna do it. I'm sorry. I, I honestly admit, I get in that fucking ring within fucking two minutes, my ass is gonna get whooped. Well, that's the thing that people like like I said before, like fan base is like new to pro wrestling, but the deathmatch wrestling has been around before I was even born. I mean, look at Abdullah the Butcher, Bruiser Brody, world class so champion good. wrestling. You know, they used to, like in the Dallas area with the Von Erics, they used to do barbed wire matches. Um, but it was always a feud. You know what I mean? It wasn't made into, like, this is a wrestling style. You know, it's it's a game. Match, you know what I mean? It's a blow off match. You know, it was supposed to be the way it was originally. Yes, sir. He's like so literally where it's like, oh, well, nobody literally dies. It's like the fact of the matter is you're uh, you're risking the possibility of dying. Like you that said, Nick, nice. they can literally die in that. You know, died and got brought back to life. So thank God he's still here. You know, and there's been a lot of Joshi wrestlers in Japan that have died, not in death matches, but just doing dives, going for moonsaults, uh, you know, Asai moonsaults and landing on top of their heads and you know, instantly gone, done. That's what I'm saying. Like it, 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 it's, it's dangerous wrestling. A lot of people will say wrestling's fake, but in my opinion, it's one of the most dangerous sports that you can get get into. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's been more people that have died in pro wrestling than you know mixed martial arts. That's. I'm sorry, but that's bad. Yeah, and if recently, if you. If you watch the interview Ken Shamrock just did uh, not that long ago, they asked him, like, which is harder, pro wrestling or MMA? And he even says, like, pro wrestling is the hard, harder the harder one because, you know, MMA, you go out there, you're training. But pro wrestling, you're actually training, you know, to take and let somebody slam you, you know? You yeah. get in a fight at the age and you're good, you get paid. But in pro wrestling, you're being told from the promoter how long he wants you to go out there and, you know, do your thing. So there's a lot of risk to it. 
especially like with light tears, like I, I hate light tears. Like they're a gamble. You know, you're taking a coin flip every time you go in there. So, you know, there's. I've heard a lot about it, but over there in Japan, by 2027, they're supposed to be banning light tubes. Well, yeah, that's the thing. They're doing that in, in Europe. Um, funny enough, they're actually they're switching fluorescent light bulbs into the LED lights. Like, funny enough, like in my shop, like I have LED lights. Um, I have like an old thing right here. This is a fluorescent light, but this is LED. And the reason in being behind that is what they're saying is there's uh, mercury, obviously, in that, that gas. Yeah. And on it, more of a pain in the ass to dispose of a fluorescent light bulb. So that's what they're saying. They're moving to the LED lights. Which, I mean, I think it's a good thing. Like, light tubes, they're overkill. You know what I mean? And you would know, probably, aside of the other ones, like Tremont and shit, one of the biggest myths is one of the, be- the one of the biggest myths is Danny Havoc died of mercury poisoning. Danny? Um, Danny Havoc. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I can't really say anything. It was obviously it wasn't mercury poison, but I don't know. They say that it causes cancer, and the thing Madman Pondo used to tell me all the time, he's like. If it causes cancer, I'll be the first one to know because I've rolled around in that shit for years, you know, and he's not kidding. He has. I honestly, Pondo or Necro, I'm sorry, but those two fucking. So, um. My next... that's a, like going back also, yeah, with the LED lights, they, you know, they say they're more uh, energy efficient. Like these have been, you know, on before we even did the podcast and I can actually touch these and they don't get hot. They won't burn you. So if this is LED or this was actually for us in the light bulb, like that would burn my hand just touching it. Oh yeah. So they LED lasts longer too. Yeah, they do. And they're just, they're cheaper. Like one of the tubes for one of those is only $6, you know, compared to going to the hardware store and getting for us and light bulbs, which are really expensive. And th- these are honestly a lot brighter. But I think at the end of the day, once they ban those, you're going to see a lot of people, like, scratching up, trying to figure out what to do next. <laughs> like, There's plenty of other options. And, you know, like, I feel like a lot of people's gotten less creative over the years. Lazy, lazy shit. Like, I, I can't stand the whole trading off light to bullshit and it's so ridiculous you know it, it's funny because uh someone had wrote online where uh you know where people actually take the weapons they use on themselves it's like you just kill the credibility of it but the thing is you don't watch like john wick and he's this badass with a you know a, any higher firearm and decides he's going to shoot himself you know it just doesn't happen exactly <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like Hey, I'm in a knife fight. Let me take this knife and, like, stab myself real quick. <laughs> I mean, you know, the light tube trade-off, it's not what... It, it's never been appealing to me. Like, I don't see the sense of standing there and letting, you know, your opponent hit you with the light tube and then you hit them. Like, <coughs> I've seen you use light tubes and you actually wait till they're on the ground and then you start fucking waylaying them like... I may be wrong, but I've never seen you sit there and just like like they're fucking drumsticks or some shit. Man, I hate that. Like I've taken light twos where you know I'll spin them and then I'll break it on the guy and then I'll break it and I'll keep breaking it the shorter it gets. But I've always done stuff too where you know shoot the guy into the Irish whip in the corner and then take two light twos and crush them down with my wrestling boot. And get that glass in the bottom of my boot and then run and do a, a boot scrape right on their face. Yeah. yeah. I always don't get into them. Or like breaking the light tubes, slamming them down on it, dragging them in, and then going for a submission hold. And that's the thing, too. Like, I think, too, when people watch death matches, they get, they get really disconnected because every time you're falling on the mat or rolling around in that shit, you're getting cut up. Yeah. It's not. 
That's not fun. <laughs> like, out, of, out of all the international opponents you've faced in the state, do you prefer to face them in the state or in their hometown? Uh, more like their hometown. Like, you know, I, I say this because a lot of times I've noticed when talent from Japan comes over, for whatever reason, and this is no bullshit, like flying from the United States to Japan, you know, for me, I've always been energized and like ready to go. But when you're going on the opposite direction from the globe, you're tired as hell. Like, what I mean is like I would fly from Japan, come back to the United States, have jet lag. But going there, as soon as I got to the country, I was ready to go. And then flying from the United States to England and Germany, it's the same thing, jet lag. But as soon as I fly back, coming back to the United States, you know, energized. I don't, it's weird. I, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person that feels that way. But I've noticed, like, when guys come in from Japan, like, their matches aren't up to par of what they're doing overseas, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm next to, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it's okay. My You're next two questions is about uh, King of the Death matches. And King of the Death matches 2017, what was in the ball that Brad Cash threw and busted you in the mouth with? Man, I have no idea. Because, <laughs> like, he, he threw a beach ball, and then he busted you right in your mouth, and then you go like that, and you instantly hit the ground. And I... Uh, I couldn't make it out, and the ball popped afterwards, but I couldn't make it out. I didn't know if it was, like, concrete or what the hell was actually in this ball. Yeah, I, honestly, I can't even remember when that happened, to tell you the truth. And then my other one was, when Bryant Woods hit hit you in King of the Death matches, did he mess up your jaw? Yeah, yeah, he popped my jaw out of place. Because, like, I've seen him hit you, and then you go to the ropes, and you get out, and you're just walking away, holding your fucking jaw, and I'm like, damn, you obviously heard that throughout the arena with the fans chattering, and I'm like, damn, he had to break my side of his jaw or, you know, fracture it or something. That's the thing, like, when I first started wrestling, like, one of these guys, you know, he, he tested me. You know, I went to go for a uh, back body drop, and he kicked me. You know, front kicked me with a toe and just got me right in my sternum. And, like, and then he super kicked me and he busted my teeth down there through my lip. And he dislocated my jaw on both sides. So anytime I get hit, my right side of my jaw will always get dislocated. And usually my mouth like this, I have to force it down and bite down to get it back in place and pop it back in. I shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think my will be painful there. So since you've been in both TOD and COD, which one do you prefer? Um, I don't know. They kind of, I don't know. I, I would say TOD, but it kind of goes, it kind of goes back more or less like I was talking about earlier. It's when it's just, a cluster of too much stuff at once. You know what I mean? I don't, I'm not a fan of it. You know, you gotta have, it just looks, it all blurs into looking the same. You gotta have your, uh, mobility or your leverage or whatever to move around in the damn ring. Uh, It's like, you want to be able to tell a good story and then show off what you can do. Um, that's the thing. I always, I always loved wrestling with, uh, Danny Havoc. Because we would go out there, do some high flying, do some almost like borderline old school basic like eight or ninety wrestling and death matches. Uh, <laughs> and I remember when we first like I had the idea for the gusset plates because I used to do house repairs and I would see them all the time at the hardware store. And this was when I was working at Ring of Honor. I wasn't even doing really really death matches, but I always thought that would be a crazy idea to have. So years later in CZW, when Danny Havoc and I did it, he was like, do you want to put carpet strips in this as well? I was like, no, let's just leave it as gusset plates and then maybe a chair or two to get this gimmick over. And my idea was to have the plate that like on off every like two or four years and then you don't touch it. But now you got dumbasses that go out there and they hammer them in their foreheads 
beginning of the match and just like kill the gimmick, which is really stupid. Like, yeah. I hate. I understand that. I definitely understand that. I'm noticing a couple of your matches. You you set you set the cinder blocks on fire. What's up with setting the cinder blocks on fire? Oh, uh, just a visual effect. You know, the thing is, like when I did martial arts, that was one of the things in breaking competitions they would do. They would set the 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 slabs of bricks on fire. You know, it's just a visual. You know, but like when Takeda and I wrestled, uh, my idea was to have the cinder blocks facing upside where the holes were up top and then have towels inside the holes with Zippo fluid and then have the sheet of glass on fire. So when you get suplex in it, the uh, glass on fire would ignite those bricks. So that was one of my ideas, you know. Fucking cool. But I bet you that fucking hurts. Oh, get the fuck off of as soon as you hit him. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I read the libido get past me on center blocks on fire. I'm like, yeah, it tickled. So, uh, Michael Cougar spoke about how you helped him, how you helped Cougar fix the fish hooks for him in the match against J.D. Orr. Yeah. Would you uh, speak on that? So, the fish hooks, they had the barb on it. And the thing is, once that barb's in you, it's not coming out. So I told him, like, you know, you can flip it down and crush it down, and that way when it sticks in you, you can pull it out. The last thing you want is getting a fish hook stuck in you and trying to rip that thing out and pulling a chunk out of you on. Like, I've gone, been a fisherman for years, you know, so I've been hooked on, like, on fish hooks, and it's not fun. Yeah, I've honestly hooked my finger i mean not bad but i've hooked my finger that shit hurt and um michael i don't know if you've seen the interview or not but he gave you props for helping him with that match and i'm like well you know if i ever talk to masada i'll tell him that you gave him props and he's like well i couldn't thank masada enough for helping me in that and i'm like i understand that you know yeah. and uh the thing that they did was, you know, you seen the match, JD wanted the hook to go through, he threw it all the way, and Michael, like, just got a little bit in, and he said, fuck it. And that's what I like me. Like, that draws me back to that skier spot with Squirrel, like, stick it in, and it's like, fuck it. <laughs> like, I'm not, I don't mind, you know, get brutal. I don't mind blood and gore and shit. I actually enjoy it, but... Y'all wrestlers, Tremont said it. He said, you know, at the end of the day, y'all are like family and y'all really don't want to hurt each other. And uh, me and Squirrel, we, we actually are family. He's my older cousin. And, um, you know, I was like, I, I, I don't want to hurt my fucking cousin. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm going to switch it. Out. In other words, I don't, uh, when, I, when I get mad, I don't care to hurt somebody that family or not but like now I'm in a good mood and I was in a good mood when I done it so I was like yeah fuck I don't want to do this <laughs> and the after effects and you can ask where I was just like for like five minutes I was stuck and he's like what's wrong with you and Brian called I was like well I got Ooh. something to tell you you know Masada's coming to the channel I'm like he was like what's wrong I'm like well Masada's coming to our channel plus Squirrel just took a scare to the head, and I'm like, I'm <laughs> lost. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, where do you see your career in five, ten years from now? Uh, five, ten years from now, uh, hopefully transition into another career. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll see, you know. <laughs> but one of the things I always wanted to do is uh, – you know, obviously with all artifacts and making knives and weapons, I always wanted to get into gunsmithing. Okay. Yeah, that's all that caught my interest. But honestly, you know, hopefully still be around doing doing things, you know. I mean, I'm 42 yeah. now. I still move around like I'm fine, so. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. You're only like 40 years old, ain't you? I was watching, with your time in Ring of Honor, I was watching one of the matches. So what was it like when you did the 450 off the top of the cage? That was cool. I mean, it was a little nerve-wracking. And the reason I say that, uh, you know, I would, when I was younger, I would do 450s. I would do springboard 450s. You watch stuff from, like, 
I mean, hell, if you could even get a hold of it. Like matches in Texas when I first started, I used to do a, a lot of high flying. So my main concern was, you know, going up on the cage and doing a 450 splash, but worrying about somebody's face, like, catching my jaw. Because that's, like, 15 feet, and I think at the time I weighed, like, 220 or 225. So that's a lot of momentum carrying. But, you know, adrenaline's popping, and just go out there and do it. And then, you know, luckily, luckily it was safe. Safe enough. How so, many other devs can say they've done that? <laughs> I mean, not many, if any. So, how many different fighting styles do you know? Uh, the only one I really trained in was uh, Taekwondo. I was second degree black belt in that. Um, that actually helped out a lot with uh, training for wrestling, especially like the balance of like running and jumping off the ropes. Um, but yeah, Taekwondo is what I studied. Done a little bit of boxing, uh, kickboxing, but nothing where it's like I went to school. You know, it's just you know you kind of have to fend for yourself. <laughs> like, Do you prefer to wrestle in the states or internationally? I mean, now, like I love I love XPW. I love working uh, for Rob. Um, back in the day, it's like I always loved going international. You know, one is like. The money and the exposure was always, always cool. Now that I'm older, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of over it. But I do have, like, offers to go to Australia, which would be awesome to finally go over. Um, really just depends, you know. It's kind of like I've missed out on so many things being a wrestler that I'm finally actually being able to do now. So, you know, I miss out a lot. <laughs> A lot of wrestlers say that they missed out on, you know, their child, children growing up and birthdays and this and everything. And a well, lot of people just say I'm full on international because I would, I would be in Japan for two weeks and then I would come to the States and I'd wrestle in the Northeast. Then I would go to Germany, wrestle there for two days, stay in England for a month go back to Germany, wrestle free shows, come back to the States, literally have enough time to wash my gear and then get back on a plane and go to Japan and stay there for like two months. Like, it's crazy. You know, like I was always, when I was a kid, I was big into like playing Street Fighter. So like the part where they actually had like a little airplane going around the world fighting people, that's how it felt. <laughs> I mean, you know, You've been, you've done it, you've done just about everything, mm -hmm. and, you know, you've done it all just about, and that's one thing that I love about you is, like, you know, as I said before, there ain't much that you ain't done, and there ain't much that I don't think you will do. I mean, you're fucking, no offense, but you're fucking crazy once you step between those ropes. <laughs> so, would you ever wrestle in Kentucky? Yeah, yeah, why not? I would have to get a, a license. That's no big deal. Shit, because that's where... They that's have where, the licenses. That's they, where... I think, sorry. I think they need to do that more often because it would eliminate a lot of people that aren't trained, but I think the commission... Like, Louisiana has the state athletic commission. You have to have a license. But the thing is, they go more off of, like... Okay. Your, wrestling and I'm boxing so when you go over there and you get your wrestling license it's not a pro wrestling license it's it's an amateur wrestling license but there needs to be some type of commission of like people that are like okay this guy's qualified or this this girl's qualified to uh go out there and actually perform like I said it would, it would eliminate a lot yeah because that's where we're from it was we're from Kentucky um we don't we don't get no death matches down here thanks to Jim Cornette and Ian Rotten. Uh, uh, yeah, that's crazy. Jim Cornette, you know, wrote the athletic and boxing commission or whatever it's called. And when Ian was running down here in Louisville, he actually had us our our shit banned. So now we're not allowed to have no death matches, even if NWL was to come down 
and a nosebleed was to happen, they have to stop the match instantly, or if it keeps going, it's fine. Yeah, and that's crazy because, like I, I told you before, like when Cornette did ran Smoky Mountain, they did some hardcore stuff, you know. And I guess it's kind of it, it is what it is. I mean, if anybody knows me, they know that I'm not a fan of Jim Cornette. I cannot stand that man. He, there's something <laughs> I cannot click with that man. Yeah. He's very so, opinionated. Some of the things he says are pretty funny. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You can't help but laugh. You know, like I said earlier, you gotta, you gotta have a sense of humor about things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'll write stuff online and people take me serious, and it's like I'm really, I'm really trying to like, <laughs> you know, piss people off or see who's actually like stands behind me. You know what I mean? But in the day, I could really give a shit less. <laughs> So was Jim Kasai your biggest rivalry? Yeah, for the longest good time going, like he, he and Danny have it. But yeah, Jim, as far as like top name, yeah, definitely him. You know, and even like well, shit. I mean, if you can't count Mexico, my rival down there was uh, the original La Parca, L.A. Park. Hell yeah! Go ahead, squirrel. What was it like being one of the first or the innovator bringing the gusset plates to the States? What's that? The gusset plates to the States? Well, the thing is, like, the gusset plates was in the United States. Like, we, like, Danny had to do it. You know, and the thing is, like I said earlier, like, I would, I was wrestling. I was actually doing house flips. Uh, remodeling houses, and I would see these things, the gusset plates at Home Depot. My boss at the time, I would tell him, like, it'd be crazy if they did these in a, a death match. And uh, I was always, always intrigued with the uh, IWA Japan death matches, like the way they set them super leathers or, you know, leather faces, and then the nail death match is what really caught my eye. And, uh, that's how I wanted them set up, was to have one by fours with the gusset plates going like this, along with the ropes. But Shorty, who was the guy that actually uh, built most of the stuff for CZW, he did it like this. And I so we can actually run in uh, rope spots. But we were the first ones to do it. And then Kasai and I, in, uh, I think the third, he brought out a, a gusset plate. Uh, board. It was like hey, like panes of glass and then the no canvas death match. Which is another so, yeah. I see a lot of people like jacking is the idea of like powerbomb Kasai through the sheet of glass to the floor. Like that was all like my my idea of thinking like let's do something cool. And then looking at things like you know Taz wrestle uh, Bam Bam Bigelow when they break through the ring was always a cool looking effect. Yes. So what do you think is the craziest match you have ever done? Mm. I mean, they, yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of crazy ones. I mean, I, 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 the death were always crazy. Probably my favorite one is Final of the Kings of Limit, the third one, with Kasai. Um, but also, like, the matches I've had with Danny Havoc. Like, there's, there's just been so many matches. They all kind of, like, they all have, like, their own things that stick out about them because they're all different. But, yeah, I don't know. It's understandable. <laughs> it's like... So, who do you think has the strongest finisher? The strongest finisher? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I think I got him on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, I mean, not deathmatch related, but Segi Moto, when he would do that deadlift German, that's yeah. like big, a fair carnival ride that you don't want to be on. Because he would lay that German in on you, and he's bridging back. So, like... 
That was always one I wanted to suck the take. <laughs> like, I'd have to say Kasai with that Paul Harbor splash. Yeah, that one's a rough one. <laughs> like, yeah, like I, I was when I actually wrote that question down. It was you and Kasai when um you when he was over here in CZW and um I can't remember the woman. I think it was Chrissy McBride. I'm not sure. One, was, uh, uh, like she had a mohawk and uh. She, it was in your CZW when you faced Jun Kasai, and then a chick, some chick came from right out. Right. And she had a mohawk, and uh, she hit Kasai, and then you won the match. That one was brutal. That was, like, probably the bloodiest match I had with Kasai. Especially drop toll holding him into the gusset plates. Kasai's crazy. Like, the thing is... I don't know how that man's still walking, you know, because he would do that balcony splash and repeatedly has done it, you know. My, uh, my feet, you know, how many deathmatch tournaments have you won overall in your career? I thought that I would have to Google. <laughs> Honestly, I would have to Google that. I never, uh, I never kept count of them. <laughs> I might actually have the question to that. I can look that up right now. Like after the tournament, I'm like, yeah, thank God that's over with. <laughs> so, uh, have you ever changed your gimmick? Because, like, I've never known you to change it. Nah, uh, never. The only time, like, my name's always been Masada. My gear has obviously changed. Like, when I did tryouts for, uh, for TNA and WWE and my gear changed when I was at NWA Wild Side. But after a while, I was just like, the hell of it. I'm just going to go with uh, the blue collar, southern metalhead look, you know what I mean? And just keep it that at that. Hell yeah. So if y'all want them, I'll read them off to y'all. There's 41. There's what? 41 tournaments that you've won. <laughs> King of the Death Matches 2023, King of the Death Matches 2022, XPW World Heavyweight Title Tournament, King of the Death Matches by IWA Mid South 2021, sorry, Nick Gage Invitation 5, Texas Death, Ma Death Match Massacre, so SoCal Crimson Cup, Tournament of Death 16, Tournament of Death 12, King of the Death Matches 17, Terminator of Death XV, Tournament of Survival, Ted Petty Invitational, Sergeant of the Slaughter, 10th Annual Lone Star Classic, Lord of Anarchy, Nick Gage Invitational Ultraviolet Tournament, King of the Death Matches 2015, 9th Annual Lone Star Classic, King of the Death Matches XLLL, Death to the Queen Tournament, Queen of the King, Queen and King of the 2013, 16 karat gold tournament 2013, Terminator of Death Europe, Deathmatch Tournament 2012, Masters of Pain 2012, Terminator of Death XL, Messengers of Death, Big Japan Tag League 2011, King of the Deathmatches 2011, Deathmatch Tournament 2011, Terminator of Death X, Terminator of Death vs. Gorefest, Deathmatch Tournament by Freedom. King of the Death, Tournament of Death, or IX on it, Tournament of Death Rewind, King of the Death Matches 2009, Maximum Tag League, Unbelievable Tag Tournament Ooh. 4, IV, Unbelievable Tag Tournament 3, and Unbelievable Tag Tournament. Yeah, that's a lot of tournaments. <laughs> Sorry for all the mess ups, but that is 41 <laughs> tournaments. Was that? That's all the ones that he's been in. Now, if y'all want the ones that he's won, the Texas Death Match Massacre, he won that at 10-08-2019. Uh, Nick Gage Ultraviolet Tournament, he won in 05-09-2015, so the fifth month, the ninth day of 2015. He won the ninth annual Lone Star Classic in 2014. 
the 16, 11, 20, 14. He won Tournament of Death Europe in 2012, 4, 11, 2012. He won Tournament of Death X in 2011, 06, 25. He won Deathmatch Tournament, which was by Freedoms, and uh, 2010, 08-25 through 0826, so both in 2010, two days apart. And he won King of the Death Matches 2009, 06 through 0703. So, a lot, a lot of tournaments. And it tells you all his tournaments. He was. If he did not win, there's only one, two, three, four. Points. There's one tournament I've always wanted to keep and compete in, and it never happened, but I always wanted to compete in the ECWA Super 8. That's one yeah. of, being an independent wrestler, that's one of the tournaments you always want to you go into. I was always there's a big fan of Reckless Youth and Twiggy Romero and che Cheetah Master and really all the, like Christopher Daniels, all the old school, like, independent wrestling legends. There's only eight or nine Matt tournaments that he was eliminated before the semifinals. The rest, he was either in the finals or in the semifinals, or he's won. Yeah. So. Still able to walk. <laughs> 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 that's a lot of a lot of carnage <laughs> yes that is a lot and like if y'all want to see like let it focus in I'm honestly wondering right now if you were to take everything from one of those matches what the bill from Home Depot or Lowe's would look like oh god <laughs> expensive crap <laughs> like, and it also has all the belts that he's won and how long he's retained them. And yeah, I uh, he rolled the title for the longest time until my knee blew out on me. He actually has 738 matches Masada has done. Like, I think it's probably better than that. If you were to count, like, the... Less well known independence is obviously more. I don't know if they count my matches in Mexico on there. I've never looked. Um Yeah, they got you back in two thousand and six. They got Japan, they got a lot of your work from uh, Mexico all over, like I don't really know how well uh, y'all it would come in. Yeah. Should be like several ones in from T of One and the Crash. Um that's cool. So, if any of y'all want to research Masada, go check out cagematch.com. So, um, since glass and fire is so unpredictable, which one do you think is worse? Uh, I mean, it really just depends. The problem, like, the vibe you there's no limit on how far this will go into you. You know, cut into arteries. Last Nick Age Invitational I did, I got a really bad laceration on my right forearm and uh, I had to take it. I'm like, nah, we're done. You know, when black blood's coming out, nah, this is over with. Oh, and literally, it, it went so deep, it even hit into my forearm bone and uh, what possibly stitched it up. Probably like a year later, I ended up having to cut out a shard of glass about like that out because it was hitting my nerve and hitting the bone so I was like a hell of this. So I just maneuvered it out and used a razor blade, cut it, pulled it out. That's happened a few times. Even in Japan, like in uh, my left calf, like the first main event I ever did in Corrigan Hall, it was uh, a tag match, but me and Bodo did the move thought with the light tubes and somehow, you know, light tube got stuck in my, my left calf and it healed off, and then for some reason, like, I can't remember, like, if my leg was hit, like, the table, but it was, like, a sharp, instant pain, and, and I'm, you know, taking a razor blade, cut that sucker out, get it done with. Yeah. 
I actually have like a piece of light tube that says here in my uh, right side of my chest. Oh shit. Yeah. Which I never noticed until like I went shooting one day and uh, I was shooting an AR-15 and you know obviously I had it back in my shoulder. The shooting is like it was cool but had this instant pain for like two weeks and I didn't know what it was and then Filling in there is like, oh crap, I have glass there. I explained that. Oh shit. Oh, I ain't got I ain't got it written down. But when you fought Matt Chimont in uh East Coast Master's of Pain twenty twelve and he falls to the floor and busts his head open, what 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 was going through your mind when they, it looked like he wasn't gonna get back up? I mean the thing is like Tremont's tough, you know what I mean? I I knew Tremont was gonna get back up. Like, Tremont's all heart, you know what I mean? Like, he's done some crazy stuff, especially a guy his size, you know, jumping off the top of, like, cages of death. But, you know, like I said, I knew he was going to get back up. And that's, like, the thing, too, like, wrestling Tremont in death matches and, then like, going in on him. It's, like, that's just, like, part of the business, you know. That's preparing him to go to bigger things, like go to Japan, because you go to Japan, they're not easy on you. No. no, not from what I think. So I, I know it hurts, but what is your thought thought process when your hair gets stuck in a fucking bobber or, or caught in the shit? Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> like, want the referee to get it out as soon as he possibly can. <laughs> I don't if mean, you want like, the match with uh, with Mammoth Sasaki and I. There's a point he gives me a superplex off the top and it's on like a like a bundle of bob wire and I bounce, you know, like I bounce off the mat, the bob wire's stuck in the canvas, but it literally just shredded up my back and it got stuck in my hair. So I'm telling the referee Bob, you know, get it out, Bob, get it out. And they cut it and they left like a strand of bob wire still in my hair and we're still wrestling. There's a part where we're going back and forth, and he put the chair and, and did the mammoth home run. And that bob bar just went shh, like right up my face, you know, my lip, my nose. Oh shit! I mean, bob bar is no joke either, you know. Look at, like, look, look at Sabu when he wrestled uh, Terry Funk, you know. Yeah, look at Omega. I'd say that I don't know, like between that. Glass and fire. Them three are the fucking worst. Yeah. I mean, there's never any part where you're like, oh, I like this this thing that's going to hurt me. I hate thumbtacks. <laughs> you I don't like thumbtacks? No, hell no. Like when they get stuck on your elbow pad and they're constantly hitting the bone or your knees, it's the worst. I don't know how Necro can go out there barefooted and wrestle in that shit. Like, my so, hat off. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned him earlier, Jack Herrup. He was like, I asked him, I was like, do you, what do you think about thumbtacks? He said, going one by one, he said it fucking hurts like hell. He said, but if you take them all at one time, he said, it's not really nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's all the nerve pain, like, of everything, you know, so it's better to get it all done with. I think yeah, you got it over with. <laughs> The tack will actually break off, like the needle part of it. Sometimes it'll break off in you. So you gotta be careful. So this question's probably getting ready to take you back in history. How was it training at Shawn Michaels' wrestling academy? I, the thing is, training at Shawn Michaels' wrestling academy it wasn't Shawn Michaels' wrestling academy. It was it, he had just got signed back in with WWF. So it was when it was transitioning from the Shawn Michaels Wrestling Academy to TWA. So mm-hmm. it was a Rudy boy, but Shawn was there. It wasn't – my first original trainer was a lot harder, like Steve Obrey. He was trained by Buck Sawyer. So he was old school with things. Like he, you know, beat your ass, stretch you, try to run you off. So a lot of training I had already done with him, I was already ready for it. So – when I went to TWA, it was polishing me off on American psychology and cardio. You know, that was a big thing is cardio. Steve was more or less like, 
going and training work shoots, Lucha Libre, Japanese strong style. And uh, it was good training with both. Like, I've trained with a lot of people. Like, any of the stuff you've seen with uh, me doing British style wrestling, I learned that from uh, from the Knight family. Oh, yeah. I'd like to see you go over to England now that, now that we got the, you know, the uh, technology or whatever to actually watch it live or a couple of days later it'll be posted on IWTV. Well, Rob Black was supposed to go to England, though. A yeah, while yeah. Back. <laughs> I don't know what happened with that. Like, I've heard, like, somebody with their politics or their beliefs did not want a uh, XPW going or working for whatever promotion that was uh, in the world. Yeah. It's whatever. You know, the thing is some people, like we talked about before, some people have to get over their bullshit because people get tired of it. I know. People, I think I know what promotion you're talking about. You can't keep uh, putting your beliefs out there and, like, forcing other people because, realistically, you're, you're screwing other people over that want to watch the product, you know? I mean... <laughs> That's going to be like, oh, fuck this person or this promotion. Like, I don't I don't want them here. You know, I hate the word cancel because it's so utterly, ridiculously stupid. <laughs> like, anybody could run a show. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You have I a mean, lot of dr- Jerk off talking shit about XBW running in Texas and like shows sold out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then another question I have, it's probably my last one, is Thursday myth that you wrestled with a broken leg for over a year. Would you speak on that? Yeah. So the thing is, like, when I wrestled. It was when I was working in, in Big Japan. I actually did uh, like a work shoot fight with a guy who was like, I don't remember what degree he was in like Shotokan Karate, but it was a show in Osaka. And like I said, it was a work shoot. And I don't think he really understood like we're going out there to, to work, but he kept giving me round kicks. And I was like, hell, but I'll just check them. You know what I mean? I've done like kickboxing. So I kept bringing my knee up, you know, blocking it off. Well, one of them, he kicked me just right, and I felt a pop. And it felt like he, like, frogged my leg. And then I quickly got him out of the ring, and then I felt, like, a pop and a crunch. And I had no idea that he actually broke it. You know, he didn't break, like, my shin. He broke the bone back in here. You can see, like, like right in here. Oh, shit. And I continued to wrestle on it. I mean, it hurt like hell. Um... But I never knew it was broken until I wrestled in Puerto Rico. And when we were leaving a sponsor dinner, going to the to the venue, it's funny, the Puerto Rican police end up, like, <laughs> hitting us from the back of the car and then charged the driver for not going fast enough, which is totally ridiculous. It's Puerto Rico for you. But I ended up getting a puncture in my leg. Um, I don't know if you can see, like, right here, there's, like, a yeah. hole. So I got a puncture in my leg on the dashboard and went and did like a Nova Bob Bar match. And then, you know, I ended up getting stuck at the airport from Puerto Rico to Florida for like a day. And then I finally got back to Texas. I ended up getting MRSA, uh, which was really painful. And um, went to the Texas Med Clinic and, you know, I told the guy, you know, I'm feeling, feeling feverish and I'm not feeling well at all. Uh, um, you know, he looked at it, he's like, yeah, that's definitely infected. He checked it, like, yeah, it's MRSA. But he also said, he's like, do you realize, like, that, uh, you have a broken leg? And I was like, no. He's like, well, if it's not broken, it's been broken. And he showed me the x-rays. And, uh, literally, I mean, I can't see it in the show, but if you imagine, like, the bone going like this, the other part of the bone is going like that, and it's healed together where, ah, damn it. Almost like a Y. That's how oh, my bone is. And when I wrestled Sammy Callahan uh, at CCW, I had the x-rays, and they had showed that on, on the TV. And I, I wrapped it up and then wrestled him. I gave him a commission. I got all these tap out. It hurt like that. Damn. You got any more questions, Squirrel? No. Asada, if you want to speak on your wrestling career or anything else, you're more than free to, bud. 
I think we pretty much like covered everything, you know. I just like tell the fans, you know, support support independent wrestling and support pro wrestling. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming on. I'll let people's views on things like ruin your opportunity of doing things that you want to watch. You know, best advice like anybody. You know what I mean? Definitely. A lot of opinions going out there these days. So this is Skinny Moose, and I'm out. That's cool. I'm out. All right, Ultra Violent Beast. Later, guys. Thank you all.